The Untouchable True School Sports Empire proudly presents something the boxing game's been missing. Hey, what's going on? It's your boy BT, and I came here to talk some boxing with the thousands of True School Sports subscribers. Now, we are officially two-thirds of the way through 90 days of boxing. Today is day number 60. What a journey it's been. What a journey it continues to be. <clears throat> and I'm so appreciative for everybody that's been tuning into these lives every single day. Whether we're tired, energetic, happy, sad, it don't matter how we feel. We have showed up and we have definitely showed out for the sport of boxing and for the um, the viewers of the channel. So I'm really appreciative for you guys. Got a great live plan for you. You know, obviously that there, there was a lot that transpired today at the Canelo Munguia press conference. Canelo said some pretty, you know, interesting things, outlandish things, I, I feel, right? Um so we'll get into all that as well as some of the other things going on going on in boxing because today was actually a pretty notable day in boxing. There's a lot of things that have been happening in our sports. So um, if you're watching live, make sure you smash that like button. If you're watching the playback, if, if it's the morning time, you're getting ready to go to work, or if you're watching later on uh, and it's the next day, please hit the like button because the likes tell YouTube algorithms that you guys like the content I put out and it pushes it out to more people. So uh, yeah, I'd be really appreciative of that. But before we get into Canelo and Munguia and Benavidez and all, all, everything else in boxing, let's take some time to acknowledge the fine folks um, here on True School Sports that have already, you know, given their thoughts and made their presence felt. So we got my man, Philippians 413, he says, Canelo is saying 200 million because he knows at the Benavidez knocks his ass out, it's going to be his last fight and he's trying to cash out. And uh, that could be it. You know, obviously Canelo Alvarez has maintained that spot as the face of Mexican boxing for a long time. So... He didn't. I don't think he wanted to give it to Benavidez because Benavidez wasn't respectful to him, and, and we'll get into all that. But you, you may have you may have you may have a point there. We got Robert Sanchez, my guy from Austin, Texas. He, he says, and, and he's saying this, this is kind of how I feel. This, this is really how I feel because you guys know over the years I've had, I've had a lot to say about Canelo. Has no been positive, but this is how I feel because every time I'm ready to just like stop, you know, quote unquote, hating on Canelo and not being critical of him. Every time I'm about to give up, he just reels me back into hating on him again because every time you get, I give him credit, he starts saying nonsensical things like what he said today, that he needed $200 million. He turns into the Dr. Evil of boxing, if you guys have seen Austin Powers. You know, he says, I need one million for fillion gazillion dollars. You know, that, that's how he sounds. He sounds like Dr. Evil of Austin Powers. So I'm right there with you, Jesus. Good to see you. Uh, Jesus M., or Robert, um, I'm, I'm with you, Robert, but hey, Jesus, good to see you. Saludos, BT. Canelo has went bonkers and at once absolutely no part of Dave Benavides. No, it doesn't It doesn't seem so. Taco TV, good to see you. Laura Zed, good to see you. Uh, hey, uh, Cash Cow says, hello, BT. What's good, Cash Cow? My man from the land down under, good to see you. Uh, Lord Zed, Canelo will beat Benavides. Easy, and I'm not a huge fan of Canelo. I root for Billy Joe Saunders and Amir Khan. I don't know, like, like, I don't got a dog in the race. I'm not really a big fan of. You guys know, like I'm, I, I, I built up quite the reputation as a Canelo hater over the years. I'm not really that anymore, but I was a big one at one point in time. Benavidez, I've been critical of him in the past just because I wanted to see him move up, and I felt like he was wasting his time trying to chase Canelo. But he's moved up, so I've let off Benavidez. But uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if it would be easy. You know, Canelo Alvarez has gotten into this habit, especially at 68, of falling in love with his power. And fighting more in spurts, we know Benavidez is a big, strong, volume puncher. I don't think that's an easy fight for him, even if he was to win. So, yeah. Is he that scared of fighting Benavidez? Shit, I step in the ring and get my best, very best for a million dollars. But, yeah, you know, Canelo Alvarez, he's already had millions, a million dollars years ago. So, you know, he's in a different pay grade than than, than any of us are here in this chat, that's for sure. Um, when Gia gets hit too much, Canelo knows how to ride punches. Canelo wins potential fight of the year. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I could see that. I, I think Munguia has improved. Munguia is, um, definitely developed over the years, you know, being with Eric Morales, being with different coaches and stuff, but, um, the holes are still there. Canelo Alvarez is a crafty of, of enough counter puncher. He's very durable. So unless he just gets old overnight, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. See, but shout out to everyone here, man. So let, let's let's get into it. I, I, I've acknowledged everybody here. Make sure you smash that like button. We got an action-packed show here on True School Sports today. So for those that know, and for those that don't know, we 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 turn our attention to screen share, and I'm gonna read you guys the quotes verbatim. So as you guys can see, Canelo wants 150 
to $200 million to fight uh, Dia Benavidez. He then went on by saying, hold on, let me put the banner here. Where we at? There we go. He then went on by saying, um, he's got all these conditions, he's got all these stipulations. So uh, Canelo was asked in plain English, you know, about these reports that Benavidez had made an offer to him. And he stated the following, and I quote, and I'll highlight it for you guys. No, no, nothing is true. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and, and, and then he went on by saying pretty much, I think the dad said they offered us $5 million. Um, do you, uh, No, never, never. Not that I know everything. So basically, uh, he, he doesn't even know himself, but he pretty much said, look, who is he for offering me the money? Basically saying that, you know, as I told you guys many times before, back when Samson Lukowicz was talking about the $55 million offer, I, I told you guys that Canelo's going to come out and start saying all these things about, well, how could they offer me anything? I am Canelo. I am the A side. So he he literally is telling you guys what I told you he would say weeks ago, right? Then he goes on, and this is really the highlight of, of everything he said. He stated the following, and I quote, and I'll highlight a few guys right here. He said, you know, Benavidez brings nothing to the table for me. He just brings 25 pounds more on fight night in the ring. But if he or some promoter, not him because he has nothing to offer me, but if a promoter who I work with, if they came to me and said, I'll offer you 150 to $200 million, I will fight tomorrow. That's the only reason I fight with him. So there you go. So Canelo Alvarez being very, very uh, adamant about why he's not fighting Benavidez. He names his price. What did, what did Ted DiBiase say? The rest of the million dollar man, he said, he said, everybody has a price for the million dollar man. So he's he's been possessed by the spirit of Dr. Evil. He's been possessed by the spirit of Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man. And he's named his price. And I really feel like all this stems from the fact that Dea Benavidez, you know, wasn't res overly respectful to Canelo Alvarez. And let's just be real, guys. Let's call it right. Anybody who's been somewhat of a threat to Canelo in, in the past that wasn't overly respectful to him, that didn't, you know, kiss the proverbial ring, he didn't fight those guys. That's just, the, that's the truth. To fight Canelo, you have to be someone that is a high, a high caliber fighter, right? But you also got to be someone that's not going to disrespect them and, and, and hurt his ego. Um, and you can't be a threat, you know? Otherwise, look, th think back to three years ago, and I, I know people hate when I bring this name up, but Demetrius Andre. Crashing the press conference, doing what he can to fight him. Andre back, you know, 10 years ago or so calling Canelo a bitch, saying he didn't want to fight him when, when Andre was champion at 54. These things never sit well or go well with Canelo. And this is just in my in my eyes, everyone's shocked that that Canelo Alvarez is ducking Benavidez. And I just think that it's history, it's history repeating itself if you've really been paying attention. And from the Canelo side of things, you know, to a degree, I understand Canelo. It's like, you know. I fought Floyd. I fought Golovkin. I fought some good fighters. I fought Bibble, right? Even though the Bibble fight, when he signed it, people weren't really looking at that as no, you know, great fight for Canelo until after the fact. But he's he feels like he's fought great fighters, and the Benavides fight doesn't make him or break him. But my opinion, right? Just just my just just my two cents. I don't think history is gonna remember Canelo um, in this whole situation with Benavides too fondly. Why? Because look. He is the he became the undisputed super middleweight champion. Um, the landscape freed up for Canelo, where Benavidez and it, and, and, it, and it's not uh up to Canelo. Like Benavidez did he did have a role into why Canelo became undisputed. You know, he lost the title on the scale, he was undisciplined, and, and and that's that's what allowed Canelo to just pick off pick off these belts one by one. Smith, Saunders, Plant, undisputed in like less than a year, right? But he's had the 168 titles for a long time. For, for a good amount of time now, so because he he won what he beat he beat Cal Caleb Plant in was it late mid to late uh, 2021. So he's he's been an undisputed champion at 68 for damn near three years now. He fought Golovkin, who was not a 68 pounder to de de defend the belts. He fought um, Charlo, who was not a, a 168 pounder to defend the belts. He fought John Ryder, who you know I I like the John Ryder fight. I thought the John Ryder fight was a good fight. Like I actually gave Canelo credit for taking that fight. I thought Ryder was the uncrowned champion. I thought Ryder was an underrated fighter. So I actually look at that as one of his better wins, but a lot of people were shitting on that fight. So you, you got three fights, two fights that weren't against 16 pounders. 
and then another fight against a guy that really and truthfully people weren't regarding highly going into that fight, right? And now he's fighting Jaime Munguia, a fighter that has improved, a fighter that has gotten better, but a fighter that has his fair share of, you know, carefully maneuvering through past opponents like the Johnny Becks and the Andrades of the world. And um, he's had some dubious decisions as well. So, you know, the jury's out on just how good Mungi is. But th the good thing is Mungi is exciting. Mungi is Mexican. So this fight will do good business amongst the Mexican fans. The fight's selling well. It's going to be a great event. So that's where he's winning in that regard. But um, I think his one because of the way he's moved at 168 since he became undisputed champion, that's where I think history is going to look and frown upon Canelo Alvarez. And then now this... I, I, like, like you guys know, I don't, I don't got a dog in the race. I'm not no big Benavides fan. I'm not no big Canelo fan. But this is a clear, like, duck. Um, you can't sit here and say Benavides should have made him an offer because, look, Canelo Alvarez said what I've been telling you guys he was going to say. How, he said himself, how could he make me an offer when I'm the A side, when I'm the guy? How could Benavides make me the offer when I'm the guy who puts the asses in the seats? And that's where we're at. So, um, yeah, man. What, what, what do you guys think? What what says the chat? What do you guys say? Let me let me let me, let me get to some of these comments, man. Shout out to everybody here. Um, we got DB boxing fans in the building, hockey out there, and the Malaysia's in the building. Um, Jesus M says Canelo will be calling out Belonga, and it will be, and he'll say it's a Puerto Rican versus Mexican war. I, that, that's another one of those fights that. They um they got in the back pocket, you know. So we'll see how it goes. Remember, the PBC deal is only a one-off fight deal. So he could do this style of PBC and then go right to Eddie Hearn. So, you know, MEZBX, shout out to him. Long time viewer. He says, Canelo kept bringing up the 25 pounds Benavidez will rehydrate to. Yeah, he did. And, 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 and I think that's his also way of saying, you know what? That's another reason I'm not gonna fight him. He's gonna rehydrate, he's gonna be too big. You know, look, Bivol is not a big light heavyweight. And Canelo had a hard, you know, we saw what happened. You, you, you got, if you watch this channel, you know what happened to Canelo when he fought Bivol. You know, 2022 was the year of Canelo being exposed by Bivol. We all know that here on True School Sports. And Bivol doesn't rehydrate nearly as much as Dave Benavidez. So if he had a hard time with that, what, what, what would happen if he fought Benavidez? It, it, it would be a difficult fight for him, even if he won. You know, only the Saudis can possibly make Canelo versus Benavidez. And shout out to Shinobi. Now, that's a great point. Canelo has named his price. Canelo has has named what it would cost for that fight to happen. And we know that nobody in America is paying anybody that kind of money for, for fights. So listen, if, if, if the, I really feel like this is a call to the Saudis, the Turkey Alice Sheik, you know, y'all want to advertise your country. Y'all want to get big time viewership. Y'all want to really make the boxing world stop and, and see what's going on in the Middle East. Well, Canelo named his price. Get the Arab money together. Send send it to Canelo Alvarez. Send some to Benavidez. And let, let's put on a, a big event for boxing because a lot of people want to see this fight. The public has been demanding, demanding this fight for damn near three years. Now, Swerve Strickland wants to know, how was the press conference? Was it boring? I didn't watch the whole press conference. I watched maybe like 10, 15 minutes. It was just overly respectful. And they were just talking about, about Mexican pride and, and basically – um, Munguia said he's thankful for the fight and, you know, it wasn't anything too crazy. The, the, the real stuff that happened came after the press conference when he was, you know, being interviewed. So it is what it is. Shout out to Mark Christopher Atkins. Good to see you, champ. Hope all is well. He says, uh, 150 to 200 million is crazy as, was crazy as fuck. It'll never happen. Oh, I, I wouldn't say never. You know, the, the Saudis are paying big money. Um, I feel like they're the only ones that can match that price, but yeah, probably more than likely that's probably never going to happen. Let, let, let's just, let, let's call it right. Let's have it right. Um, everybody seems to be in agreement that we need to call Turkey Al Sheik and get this done. And DB says that it could be a, it could be a, just a power play. It could be, he may, he, he may just be saying all that to drive the price up of the fight because you guys got to remember it's been three years and some change of, 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 of promote, pro, uh, promotion and build up and. And um, the value of this fight's been going up with each passing Canelo win, which each with each passing Benavidez win, the price of the fight has been going up. So um, maybe Canelo doesn't get 150 million, but maybe he gets 80 million, maybe he gets 75 million, maybe he gets, you know, he, he can still get a big purse for this fight, and it would still be big. So uh, 
we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But um, more more stuff in regards to Canelo Alvarez and Benavidez or, and um, Munguia, right? Because Canelo said a whole lot. He said a lot of things. He said a bunch of bullshit. One thing that he said, and I, I, and I, I highlighted this on Twitter today. Um, Canelo said one, one of the things that I that I caught. And by the way, guys, if you guys are on Twitter, make sure you guys follow me on on the Twitter at True School Sports. You know, I'm 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 on there pretty frequently. So if you ever want to get in touch with me, give me a follow, shoot me a tweet, or you know, DM whatever, and we can talk boxing. But um, one of the things Canelo said, and I tweeted about it when I was watching the press conference. He said, and I quote, he pretty much said that he was happy to give Munguia the fight despite the fact that he said he wouldn't fight Mexicans because Munguia was respectful. And I'm, I'm saying that I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, what does he mean respectful? Like what sport does Canelo think this is? This isn't, this isn't a tennis where you, this isn't tennis where you shake hands. And you know, when, when, when Novak Djokovic kicks Roger, Roger Federer's ass at the Australian open, you know, they give a speech and they talk about how great their opponent was and they and they blow smoke up each other's behinds. This ain't tennis. This ain't golf. This ain't croquet. This ain't badminton. This ain't pickleball. This is boxing. This is the most barbaric, most toughest sport in the world. So really and truthfully, yes, you would ideally you would like mutual respect with your opponent, but you don't gotta be respectful to someone who wants to punch you in the face. So I think Canelo Alvarez, I mean, I, he obviously he's a very tough, proud man. He's He's been boxing since he was a kid. He's been professional since he was 15 years old. So you give him that respect for a guy who's been professional for so long. But come on, man. Like, you got to you gotta stop having such a, a sensitive ego. Like, it's, it's corny. So he lied, to the, he, lied, he lied to the boxing fans because he said, I don't fight Mexicans because I represent Mexico. But it's okay to give Munguia the fight because he was respectful. And respectful meaning that he's... You know, I don't want to sit here. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist and say Munguia is going to take a dive or he's not going to try. But I mean, Munguia has never been never been one to talk trash. So you know, he's been, he, he he remains consistent. But um, come on, man, like you give me a break because he was respectful. You know, um, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I but that that was one of the things during the press conference. I mean, there there wasn't a whole lot of things to pick out that happened. You know, because it was just Canelo talking about Mexican pride and talking about how this fight's going to be a celebration in Mexico. And I listen, shout out to Mexico. I love Mexico. I love Mexican boxing. But, you know, the way he's acting with the whole Benavides situation, how could anybody with who, who who's honest and righteous and just and, and, and is intellectually honest with themselves about boxing, how could anybody fix their, fix their lips and flap their gums and ever say that Canelo Alvarez is better than a guy like Salvador Sanchez? They're not even in the same solar system as far as skills. And Salvador Sanchez never acted this way. Obviously, his life got cut short. But, like, even in the short time he was here, like, to me, he is the gold standard. He is the best Mexican fighter that ever lived. And I've gotten into so many arguments on YouTube over the years, specifically in 2021, 2022, when the Canelo hype was at its peak. And um, people used to say he was the best Mexican fighter ever. And I'm like, guys, stop. Stop. He's not even in the same solar system as Salvador Sanchez. Forget, like, you guys are saying he's number one. He's not even in the same caliber, not even from the same cloth as a guy like Salvador. So, um, you know, Munguia, like, I'm going, like, I'm talking all this about Canelo right now. When they fight, I'm going for Canelo because I, I, I got my feelings about Munguia. But honestly, like, all this stuff Canelo is saying is, is kind of making me, like, I, I might want Munguia to win now. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, People co-sign this. People, there's people out there that are co-signing this foolishness. Two hundred million dollars sounding like Doctor Evil. You want you want generational wealth to fight David Benavidez? It's ridiculous. Electric Hippo says, "Did you see the Illuminati handshake between Nello and Munguia? It's all stage. No, I, I didn't see it, but you know, listen, it is what it is, man. Uh, it's a gentleman's sport. Yeah, no, it, sometimes it, it depends, like." It it is a gentleman's sport. I get what you're saying, but someone's coming to punch you in the face. You got listen. The, the, people like to say it's a gentleman's sport, but the reality is, when you sign a contract, that the harsh reality of boxing is, you are fighting somebody who's going to a training camp. They are they are going to more than likely seclude themselves from their family, miss birthdays and very important moments um, in their kids' lives, miss out on quality time with their wives. 
and they're training to render you unconscious, right? So there's nothing gentleman like about that. And if the fighter that signs a contract to fight you or wants to fight you, if he gets if he starts talking a little bit, well, guess what? It's well to the fight right to talk about you because this is he's, he's trying to punch you in the face. Somebody who wants to punch you in the face doesn't gotta be overly respectful for you. And I think Canelo all these years fighting guys like Saunders and, and Callum Smith, these guys that were overly respectful. That's what he's used to. So when someone talks, he don't like that. It's ridiculous. You're too in your feelings, bro. I'm not in my feelings. I, I don't feel any way towards the fight. Like, I'm pretty calm, actually. You think you you think I'm in my feelings? I don't really, I don't like Canelo Benavidez or Benavidez. I'm indifferent towards the whole situation. So my thing is um. All I'm all I'm talking about is from what I, what I've seen over the years, being here on YouTube. The fight that I always hear people say they want to see is Canelo versus Benavidez. I've I've I've, heard, I've seldom heard people over the years say they want to see Canelo versus Jaime Munguia. It's always been Canelo Benavidez, Canelo Benavidez, Canelo Benavidez. Right now, even though I don't really care for the fight, and I'm happy Benavidez as a light, as a light heavyweight, and he's gonna go try to fight the guys like better be ever Bivol. The public in general wanted to see him fight Benavidez, uh, Benavidez fight Canelo, and I'm not a selfish guy, so that's what I'm, I'm speaking on. I'm speaking on the interest of boxing fans. Who doesn't say something and change their mind? It's no big deal. This is going to be a, a great fight. It, it'll be a fun event. Um, we'll see if it's a great fight. But shout out to everybody here. I want to see Canelo Alvarez versus Floyd Mayweather match. How much would that cost? Shit, I don't know. Uh, that, that, that would cost a billion dollars probably because Floyd ain't coming back. You know, he had beef with Laura and GGG and he still fought them. But but that's different. See, th those those are different stages of his career. When he fought Laura, much younger than he is now, still very much trying to prove himself in the sport. Golovkin, legacy-defining fight. Benavidez, while it's a it's a big fight for boxing, it's it, 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 it'll add to the legacy, but I don't think it's a legacy-defining fight. But... It's becoming a blemish because of the way he's handling it. He's he's had the belts for multiple years now. This this, this is going to be his what fourth defense of the undisputed title, which is impressive. But two of those defenses were against guys who are not 168 pounders, and the 168 pounder that he did fight wasn't highly regarded going into the fight, which was John Ryder. So you know, make of it what you will. Now shout out to Manny. He says, bro. Munguia has zero defense. All Canelo's team is talking about is Munguia's power. Yeah, he's got power, but no defense, no enough experience. Canelo will take this kid to school, hitting him to the body. And, and, and that's how I feel. I feel like this is the definitely the more winnable fight. Munguia, yes, he's a volume puncher. Munguia is defensively um, a lot easier to hit than the guy like Benavidez. Benavidez isn't like slick or anything like that, but Benavidez is very good about picking the shots off, and he's not as easy to, to hit as people think. He showed his defense um, to be, you know, good, good enough, more than good enough against the likes of Plant and Andre and, um, and other fighters as well. Uh, but Munguia, win, lose, or draw, Munguia is getting pieced up by everybody he fights. So uh, it don't matter if it's Jimmy Kelly, John Ryder, but those guys did, just didn't have the firepower for him. So I, I can't really see, unless Canelo gets overnight, I can't see how Munguia beats him. Um, do you think Munguia has enough time to prepare I mean, he's had 40-plus fights to prepare. He's had 40-plus fights to prepare. I'm sure he's he's always thought in the back of his mind that this could be a fight uh, for the future. So I'm sure he studied Canelo over the years watching his fights. I, yeah, he's had plenty of time to prepare. What do you think? I think I think it's plenty of time to prepare. He he He's had 40-something fights to prepare. He's fought all these different styles. He's He's been trained by Eric Morales, Robert Alcazar, now Freddie Roach. If there's ever a fighter in boxing that has, that, that has had ample enough time to, to prepare for Canelo Alvarez, it's Jaime Munguia. So um, make it that what you will, you know. David announced his fight. He was fighting Vazic before Canelo's fight. Well, yeah, he announced it because Canelo was never going to fight him. That's why. He wasn't going to fight him. Shout out to Jairo. Jairo says, finally, you're seeing the light. You're defending David Benavidez and picking Munguia. I didn't say I was picking Munguia. I don't, I don't even have a pick. I'm just telling you that Canelo Alvarez is talking so much nonsense that if Munguia won at this point, I wouldn't even be upset. Because now, I'm when I hear Canelo talk how he's talk, it's 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 reminded me of why I used to always be so against him because I always saw him as a guy that 
yeah, he was talented. Yeah, he's an aggressive counterpuncher. Yeah, there's some great things he does in the ring, but he's always been a guy that's been taking calculated gamb- calculated risks. You know, I don't think Canelo was like he's he's a very good fighter, but to me, I don't look at him as I I, I didn't look at him as a great fighter when he won his first world title. He fought Matthew Hatton, and he didn't even fight Matthew Hatton at, at, at his actual weight. He was throwing in catch weights to fight Matt the Matthew Hatton's of the world. So it's like, come on, man. You want to talk about this guy up there with guys like Salvador Sanchez. Please give me a break. You know? And that's what I'm saying. Like, I got a long memory with Canelo. I got a very long memory. I remember before he fought Golovkin, and maybe, maybe some of you guys most, may have forgotten, but I haven't forgotten. I remember when... Golovkin was knocking everybody out, and pe- the boxing public was calling for him to fight Golovkin. He was he was trying to tell, tell Golovkin to fight him at, at 155, and he said that if Golovkin don't fight me at 155, then we're never going to fight. You guys remember that? Because I, I sure as hell do, you know? You know, I give him his credit. He fought Golovkin, but um, fought him three times, you know? I, nobody asked for the third fight, but, you know, he fought him twice, and they, they were great fights, and they were... Good fights for boxing as far as at the gate. And and so, you know, he, he's been good for the industry. He's been good for the uh, fight, for the sport as far as generating interest amongst casual fans. But I've never, go back in the history of my ch- I've never been, I've never thought Canelo was as great as most people think. Um, very good fighter. You know, I think I think Canelo has also been the benefit of two things. I, th- I think Canelo has been the beneficiary of, like when he, when he was a young fighter, you know, there wasn't no big time like Mexican fighter. So he he came along at the perfect time when boxing was desperate for a Mexican star. And he's been able to garner the fan base um, because of that. And he's been able to remain very active in a time where inactivity has plagued the entire sport. So he's been more visible than most fighters. So he's he, he's benefited from a lot of a, a lot of circumstances. But you know, very good fighter, good fighter, whatnot. Just not what you guys think he is. Not not what a lot of people make him out to be. Not no Salvador Sanchez, not no Chavez, not not Eric Morales caliber, but you know, very good fighter. You know, top 10 Mexican fighter of all time for sure. You know, someone that's been good for the sport, someone that's got different styles and is a is, is a smart, intelligent, aggressive counterpuncher. There's some good things about Canelo Alvarez, but Salvador Sanchez, he is not. Julio Cesar Chavez, he is not. Eric Morales, he is not. And, and and if and if and if anybody thought he was those things, hopefully this whole thing of Benavidez could open their eyes up a little bit, you know. BT, do you think Canelo would ever get that scratch back with Canelo Alvarez? Um, it's up, it's all up to Canelo. I mean, at the end of the day, um, Canelo Alvarez is a superstar. He's the guy that calls the shots. He's the guy that puts the asses in the seats. He's the guy that is the money man, right? So it's as simple as this, and, I, and I've said this in other videos in the past. Anybody who Canelo really had a burning desire to fight, think, think, think anybody he's fought, Floyd, uh, even Golovkin, you know, even though it took a while, Golovkin, anybody who he really and truthfully wanted to fight, guess what? He fought them because he was in a power position to do so, being that he dictates a lot of things because of the money he generates, the fan base he has, the ticket sales that he has. So the reason he didn't fight Bivol is because of himself. If he wanted to fight Bivol, Bivol told him what he wanted. And Bivol earned the right to tell Canelo what he wanted because he gave Canelo a boxing lesson. And he said, look, I already whooped your ass at 175. I don't want to fight you here again because it's too easy. So let me go down to 168 and maybe try to get a shot at those belts. But Canelo didn't want to do that. But he's had no problem fighting, you know, 54-pounders at 68 um, or 60-pounders at 68. So I don't think he's there fighting Bibble again. That ship has sailed. And Bibble has already closed the book on that. He's 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 focused on something much more important, much more significant, and that's the fight with Arthur Betterbiev, arguably the best fighter in the world. Too. Bibble and Betterbiev, to me, the winner of that fight is going to have a great argument for best fighter in the world. So. Um, much more significant in, in, in my humble opinion. But um DB box activity got look, that, that's what I'm saying. I'll never I, that's the one thing I'll, I there's there's two things I can there's two things I can give Canelo credit for. The first thing I give him credit for is his activity, right? Second thing I give him credit for, and this more than anything in his career, is that he's been with Eddie Reynolds from the very beginning of his career from when he was 15 years old to now. It's very rare to see that. He's very loyal to Eddie Reynoso through the wins, through the losses, through the great performances and the not so great performances. He's remained with Eddie Reynoso. So I res- there are things that I do respect about him. It's just that I just remember in 2021, man, like people, 
people were getting very carried away trying to trying to say he was better than guys like Salvador Sanchez. And Salvador Sanchez would have never operated like this. Never. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, we already know that. Look, look, we already, it's there's no problem with a guy having your number. Bibball is just too good for Canelo. They could fight a hundred times, Canelo will never win. It is what it is. Maybe, maybe get a gift, but never like legitimately beat him. Um but it is what it is, man. Uh, some people never thought Roman Gonzalez uh, was great like you, but no. But see, Roman Gonzalez is great. You want to know why Roman Gonzalez is great? <sighs> Roman Gonzalez, Roman Gonzalez never did no bullshit like this. And guess what? He he was like the Canelo of those weights. He he was the money guy at those weights. He he's the Roman Gonzalez is the reason why guys like Naya and Inoue are making the kind of money they're making now because he opened the door. He he was the guy that put the weight classes on the map. But everyone, every, anyone that was in position to fight him, for the most part, he's fought them. Um, even in his losses, like even when he lost to Rumbasai the first time, which I thought he won, I thought he was robbed. I thought he, I thought he did enough to win the fight. Uh, but even in his losses, he's he's never. I mean, he got knocked out one time, but he's never conclusively been defeated like Canelo does when he fought Floyd or when, or Canelo when he fought Bivol. In my opinion, it is much worse. To get knocked, the, it is much worse to get beat significantly over 12 rounds. Like get out box, like lose a 117, 111, you know, lose a 118, 110 type of fight. It's worse to lose that way than to get knocked out because anybody can get knocked out. All it takes is that one punch that you place in your chin, you can get knocked out, right? But to lose that conclusively at the top level, you know, to the, to guys like Bivol and um, Floyd. That never happened to Roman Gonzalez ever. Anytime he lost was um was either you know fights that were close that some people would deem robberies or the one bad night he had where he got knocked the hell out against Roman side, which could happen to anybody because fighters greater than Roman Gonzalez got knocked out. You know. Are you a big fan of the Guatemala monster, Lester Martinez? The only good thing about Canelo's fights is the sports bar club of hoes and groupies that don't know anything about boxing. Go, that's what you know. What I'll, I'll say that I'll, I'll give Canelo credit for that. You know, I've gone. To, I went to his fight against Billy Joe Saunders. There was a lot of them there, and I can attest to everything he's saying. I've been to Canelo Alvarez watch party, so you know what? It, it ain't all bad, right? It, it ain't all bad. You know, there are great things about Canelo Alvarez. Nobody's one hundred percent bad. You know, so I'm um, look. Hopefully, the Munguia. The Munguia fight um, winds up being a great fight for boxing, and um, let's let, 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 let's just be optimistic. Let, let's hope it's a great fight. But honestly, today's press conference wasn't really promising. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it all turns out. Um, Roman Gonzalez got balled up a few times. He got balled up once, which was the worst night of his life. Which was, he shouldn't even have been in the ring. His trainer just died two months before, before the fight. Um, he didn't even have a real corner for that fight, and he got knocked out. So it was what it was. He fought him. But other than that, the the second guy will fight was a robbery. The first one was side fight could have went either way, and the third guy I was trying to fight. I thought he lost. I thought he did enough to win that fight, but you know that one was probably the one fight that guy really did win of the trilogy. So other than that, the only bad night he had was the knockout loss. But he never, Roman Gonzalez never. Got schooled the way Canelo did against Floyd or Bivol, which to me is worse because it is much harder when you're in the boxing ring. It is much harder to to win nine, ten, eleven rounds against a top tier opponent than it is to knock somebody out. I I think so. I mean, maybe you guys disagree. Maybe you guys think it's harder to knock somebody out, but for me, in a twelve round championship level fight against like world class opposition, to beat them nine, ten, eleven rounds out of twelve. Come on, that, that that's 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 a true display of dominance, and that's what Floyd and Bivol both did to Canelo. And it's, and it's you know depending on who you ask, even Golovkin in the first fight, some people thought that was a fight that he won pretty soundly, and he got robbed. So, um, you know, very good fighter, but not what a lot of people made him out to be. Um, thank you. You were one hundred percent about. Yeah, trust me, I know I am. Great fighter, you know. Um, I remember when Canelo Alvarez tried to get his fighter, Julio Cesar Martinez, to beat up Roman Gonzalez. And he came there, 
and 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 he got he got, he sat ringside so he could so he could watch greatness in action. Roman Gonzalez beat the brakes out Julio Cesar Martinez and sent his ass right back down to one twelve. So, uh, you know it is what it is, man. Shout out to Canelo. Shout out to Munguia. Hopefully it's a good fight. You know, um, I know it's gonna be a great event. I'll be in I'll be in Vegas that week for the Boxing Fan Expo. So if anybody here is gonna be at the Boxing Fan Expo, I would like to meet some of you guys. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be at the actual fight, but. We'll see how it goes, but uh, I'll definitely be at the expo. So if any of you guys are gonna be there, let me know. But um, listen, y'all can continue to chime in about y'all can continue to chime in about Canelo. Um, there's other things that happened in boxing, and I wanted to get to that as well. But um, get your get your comments in about Canelo and Benavidez. He said, "Dude, you said Andre was the man. Your 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 opinion is garbage." I mean, he was he was good enough for Canelo not to not fight him and duck him for a gajillion. Like it's actually hilarious. Y'all y'all Canelo fans will run. Y'all will say all this shit about Andre. And mind you, okay, yeah, he lost Benavidez to sixty eight, got his ass beat. He wasn't quite as good as I thought he was, and that's okay, right? I had to accept some harsh truths about Andre, but it makes it makes Canelo look worse that he didn't fight Andre because of how he got beat by Benavidez. That's that's not no that's not no like that's not no. Um, Credit to Canelo what happened to Andrew. It's a credit to Benavidez, not Canelo. So, you know, y'all got to sit with that. Y'all got to marinate on that. But um, listen, I'm not here to talk about Canelo or and Andre. We already beat that to the ground. There's plenty of videos on that. If you want to hear those videos, they're in my archive. They're still up. If y'all want to learn about the, the truth about that situation, just go back and watch the old videos. But listen, there's plenty of things that happened in our sport. Continue to mention Canelo and Benavidez if you want. But, um... I wanted to talk about a couple other things in boxing. So uh, shout out to everyone here. Make sure you smash that like button, subscribe, super chat. Um, we're going to go to screen share because Canelo ain't only Mexican making headlines today. All right. Vaquero Navarrete has officially announced this fight. Hold on, guys. Get my charger right quick. But um, Vaquero has announced his fight May 18th. He'll be moving up to 135. To take on Dennis Branchik. And it'll be in a very great city. Quite possibly the most beautiful city in the USA. And that's uh none other than San Diego. You know, just but let, let's read the official report. Here it is on uh rainmagazine.com. Shout out to rainmagazine.com. So yes, Navarrete takes on Dennis Branchik May 18th at the Pachanga Arena, which is where Roma Gonzalez beat the brakes off of uh, Julio Cesar Martinez in front of Canelo. But at the Pachanga Arena, May 18th, right? Same day, same day. As Tyson Fury versus Usyk, so it's it's, it's going to be a star-studded day that day. It's going to be a very action-packed day. You got Usyk versus Fury battling it out for undisputed uh, earlier in that day. You got this fight at night. That uh, May 18th is also ha happens to be the birthday of Pops. So make sure you guys May 18th comes ha come say happy birthday to Pops. You know he'll be um, he'll, I'm sure either I'll be live or he'll be live or so, you know just make sure you wish him happy birthday. So um, on that card, Giovanni Santion is going to be. In the co-main event, um, he doesn't have an opponent now announced yet. So, uh, you know, going to be a really fun night, fun, fun night of boxing. Uh, Baranchik was a uh, 2012 Olympic silver medalist. You know, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm, a, I'm this Dennis Baranchik expert. I saw Dennis Baranchik fight one time against Anthony Yigit on the Usyk Dubois undercard in Poland. And, um, you know, he, he, he like nothing, like he didn't blow me away. He just seemed like the prototypical you know, regimented, mechanical, European softball. So I feel like this is a calculated gamble by top rank and the fine folks over there and Team Navarrete to try to get him a belt. And uh, should he go ahead and win the fight, it's going to set the stage for, you know, a big a big time fight, which, of course, Stevenson later on in the year. So as long as he handles business against Baranchik, he'll be, he'll, he'll be in business for a, a big fight. Uh, later in the year, so I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, Navarrete, he's the guy that breaks all the rules in boxing. Like this guy doesn't do anything by the book, and he's fun to watch. And um, who knows, man? I, I love San Diego, so it, it's a great excuse to go out to San Diego. I'm really intrigued to see what happens with Giovanni Santiana as well, because Giovanni Santiana is a fighter that he had a sensational performance against Alexis Rocha. I feel like top rank hasn't really pushed him. They haven't really given him the push that he deserved after such a sensation to win. I mean, he hit Alexis Rocha. He, 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 he was possessed by the spirit of Roy Jones. And he, he hit Alexis Rocha with not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six 
right hooks. And they didn't, they barely talked about it on social media. They were, they were too busy promoting Fury and Ngano that week. So um looking forward to seeing what kind of opponent they get him because he's he, he's one of the only guys at welterweight that I really care about watching fight because the division's pretty barren right now with with talent and names. And he had he, he's coming off of a beautiful performance. So should be a lot of fun. What, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about Navarrete and May 18th, San Diego, Dennis Baranchik? He says, you're really going to skip the NHL playoffs to go to San Diego? Uh, nah, man. I uh, I don't know. I don't know. It depends. It depends. I'm just talking right now. I, I like San Diego, so I, I, may, I may make a short trip there and, and go watch the fight, but I don't, I don't know. Um, NHL playoffs are going to be very big. Uh, NHL playoffs begin next week. You know, it'll be Panthers road to the Stanley Cup. So, um, yeah. Canelo fans don't know what real boxing is all about. You know, sh listen, shout out to Canelo fans. We, 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 we need the Canelo fans. They, you know, love them or hate them, they still pay their hard-earned money and keep the help, help keep the sport going. So we can't, we can't just be all negative. Rocky Austin says, Fundora doesn't deserve the fight against Tim. It should be Surrey versus Tim in the main event and Mendoza versus Fundora rematch in the undercard. WBC obviously has favoritism towards Fundora, the hype job. Well, the, like I always like, like I always say, when it comes to anybody who works at Samson Lukowitz, never underestimate the power of Samson Lukowitz. I've seen, I've seen this shit in person in real life. Like when, when I went to the WBA convention, I've seen how the sanctioning bodies light up and smile. Um, when he's in the room, you know, so I, I don't know what he does to these people, but whatever it is, it's working. So make it that what you will. Um, Adrian says, shout out to pops. Where is pops? Pops is asleep. Pops is, pops is uh dead asleep. You know, I, I told him to come on the live. Uh, I, I told him he can jump in whenever he wants to, but he's, he's probably in the middle of REM sleep. So we're, we're doing it solo dolo tonight. So you know, shout out to everybody who's joining and, and watching the live and getting their thoughts in on Canelo and Benavidez and Munguia and the and the and this whole two hundred million dollar thing. Shout out to Johnny. He says, "Uh, going through pain, uh, but we here, champ. We we'll hope, hope all is well." You know, and yeah, man, Giovanni Santiago. He's the he's the I've heard, you know top rank people at top rank say he's the future of the welterweight division. I like him. I think he's uh I think he he made a big statement his last fight against Rocha, and uh, I want to see I want to see them give him a, a bit more push. I know I know they're gonna give him a cold feature on a on a on a notable card, but like man, when he when he knocked out Rocha, I just don't feel like they promote they pushed him the way they should have. They were they were too busy they were too busy up Fury and Ngannou's ass the whole week, and I just. I didn't like it. I, I didn't like the lack of push for Giovanni Santiam. Because when you put a when you put on a crowd pleasing performance like that, you know you gotta really give a give a guy more push than they gave him. Um, Giovanni Santiam versus Pete, Pete Dobson. What do you think? I'm a fan of both fighters. You know, I like I like Giovanni. Obviously, Pete Dobson's a friend of the show, but Pete hasn't lived the life of a, like I don't think he's been living the life of a fighter. I mean. Judging by his Instagram, you know, I just I just saw a post the other day, and I, I know you've seen it too, Johnny. He was in Miami here on the boats with with all the the harlots and the whores, and they were shaking their asses, and it, and he looked like he was enjoying the fruits of his labor for the Conor Ben fight a little too much, and he was damn near celebrating like he won the fight. So, um, I'd question what kind of shape he's in. You know, I mean, it's a good fight, but I. I wouldn't want to see it just because I don't I don't think Pete Dobson will be in the right condition. I think Giovanni Santion, if Pete isn't in proper shape, Giovanni Santion will, will blow right through him, honestly. Giovanni versus the Japanese dude will be great so we can pack him up. I'm sick of hearing about Jin Suzaki. Yeah, man, that's the fight we need right there. Jin Suzaki versus G. I, I, I love that fight. And um, that listen, Boots Ennis versus Jin Suzaki. That's another fight I want to see, but. You know, Jin Suzaki got to build his name up. Got, he's, got, he's got to build his, his reputation up more. So when I go to Japan late, later on in the year, I'm going to go interview Jin Suzaki at his gym. And we're going to try to build him up a little more here in boxing because he's a fun fighter to watch. He's an explosive puncher. He's one of the most exciting fighters in the welterweight division. And he's someone that I feel should be getting mentioned a bit more, you know. But he's got work. To, he's got some work to do. Um, now, this is a completely non-boxing related question, but I want to answer it. 
Hawker Mustang says, did you hear that Bruno Mars is having a big gambling problem? He's $50 million in debt to the casino. Listen, I did hear about it. That like boggles my mind because going to Vegas the last three years, anytime you walk the strip, you see signs of Bruno Mars on the strip. They advertise the hell out of Bruno Mars. So how the hell could he be $50 million in, in debt? He's got to be a real degenerate to be that much in debt. So, um, you know, prayers go out to him because the last people you want to owe money to is the MGM. <laughs> they got some powerful people over there, you know? So may God be with them. But, yeah, we, we, we touched on Navarrete, right? And uh, another thing I want to touch on is this, right? I, 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 don't, know if, I don't know if y'all seen this today, but I want to touch on it right quick. Terrence Crawford, he – um. He got a star today on the on the Walk of Fame in Hollywood, and here here he was today, pictured with as you guys can see to the right, Fifty Cent, the middle, Dr. Dre, all the way to his left, the man that walked him out for the infamous Earl Spence fight, Eminem. So um, he got a star on the Walk of Fame, and we know that Terrence Crawford has become a lot more mainstream since he beat Earl Spence, and rightfully so. You know, it was a big fight. Um, he performed exceptionally. And, um, like, you guys may laugh, but, like, I feel like even stuff like this may even drive his market value up because he's going to be looked at as a bigger star now. That This actually, believe it or not, this drives the price up of a Terrence Crawford purse, the fact that he got a star on the Walk of Fame. And, um, look, we know that Tim Zhu and, and the winner of Tim Zhu versus Fandora, they've been ordered to fight uh, Terrence Crawford. Um, if, if, if Zhu, who is the favorite, does what he's supposed to do, we might get Zoo versus Crawford by the end of this year, and that'd be a great fight for boxing due to Terrence Crawford's star power in the sport now, and now this, and and and, and Tim Zoo having the whole country of Australia behind him. That's a big fight. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think about Terrence Crawford getting a star on the Walk of Fame? I'm not, I'm not sure how many active fighters have a star on the Walk of Fame, but it can't be no more than one or two fighters at a time. You know, I mean, I'm not even sure. Does, 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 does Canelo have a, a star on the Walk of Fame? I'm not so sure. These boxes are going to have to start taking a pay cut, BT. They do. Um, they have. I, I feel like they do. They, they, some of these guys do have to take a pay cut because, um, you know, a lot of these guys are pricing themselves out of fights. I mean, Canelo Alvarez, you you want to talk about pricing yourself out of a fight? He he, he priced himself he priced himself way out of a Benavidez fight. Who the hell is gonna pay anybody two hundred million dollars for box for, for boxing? <clears throat> Floyd Schofield looks to be teaming up with Juan Guzman. Man, I'm really excited to see what he can do. Yeah, Kid Austin needs to learn how to stop lunging into um, you know, he leaps in, and you know, when you when, when he fights like, like a top tier, experienced, you know, polished boxer, his ass is gonna be grass. You know, so th that's true. Good. You know. Yeah, Spence chills with the local rappers, the, the, the Texas guys. Terrence Crawford chills with the international superstars. You know, so levels, levels. You know. But yeah, man. I mean, it is what it is with Crawford. He came a long way from Nebraska. That's right. He did. He did. Terrence Crawford came a long way from. Being the being that being that dude from Nebraska that nobody knew in boxing, so you you know you, you gotta respect his story, you gotta respect his grind, and hopefully, you know um, Tim Zhu. I'm hoping Tim Zhu beats Fondura, just so we can get Terrence Crawford versus Tim Zhu because that, that that's a fight I really want to see. And it's you know if Fondura wins, cool, then we can get Fondura versus Crawford. But um, I like Zhu versus Crawford as one of the best fights in boxing. Really, really and truly, I, I think that's one of the best fights in boxing for one of the best fighters in boxing. And listen, guys. The last thing I'm going to touch on when it comes to the news, because it it, it, it popped up on BoxRec today. I saw a Ring Magazine post an article about it today. I saw a couple of people tweeting about it today on the Twitter. And now that now that it's been now that it's been talked about, now that it's been somewhat announced, I can talk about it because I've known about this news for a long time. So y'all can mark mark your calendars. Mark your calendars for April the 10th. Angelo Leo returns again. Uh his third fight. In five months, his third fight since November, and he's taking on a very tough Mexican fighter in uh, Eduardo Baez. April tenth, Pro Box TV, the the road to becoming a two division champion and proving that he is not just uh, going to be a champion at featherweight, but also one of the best fighters in the world. You know that continues. 
And I, I want to talk about that here for a second because, you know, I, I've, I've known, I've literally known about this fight for well over a month and I couldn't say anything, but it's been, they've been tweeting about it on Twitter. As you guys can see, it's popping up on box rec now. So I can talk about it now. He's taking on a water bias, you know, and, um, I'm so happy for him because this is a guy, this is a, a fighter, Angelo Leo, who, you know, I know I know how hard he works. I know how much he loves the sport of boxing. I'm going to tell you all this about Angelo, guys. He's the kind of fighter that fight fans should want to be champion because he's an exciting fighter. He fights in the pocket. and He, he hasn't even really showed you guys everything in his skill set. That, that's the crazy thing about it. He's been champion. He's beat some good fighters, but he hasn't even really showed you guys everything that he's capable of. So um, I'm looking forward to, you know, these next couple of fights because I feel like these next three to five fights in his career are going to be like his true prime. You're going to see the best Angel Leo, right? And he didn't fight from the Aaron Alameda fight in uh, June of 2021. He didn't fight for two over two years. And you know, he came back in uh, November of 2023. He, he beat Nicholas Polanco's arm out of his socket. Just this past January 31st, he, he, he fought Mike Planilla and scored one of the most devastating one-punch liver shots you'll ever see in boxing, he made a statement there, and now he's taking on Eduardo Baez, his third fight in five months. Baez is a guy that's you know a tough Mexican fighter, has a very awkward rhythm, likes to find the pocket, but he's got a lot of good experience. You know, um, Baez's most notable win came against a uh, fellow Mexican volume puncher Enrique Vivas. You know, we all know Enrique Vivas can throw as many punches as anybody in the, in the division, and he was able to outwork him to a majority decision. You know, he fought Rai Salim, who was a top contender, gave him a tough fight. Everyone he's ever fought, pretty much, he's given a tough fight a tough fight to. The only guy that's really had, like, a definitive knockout, like, victory statement performance was a great fighter in Vaquer Navarrete. So the fact that, yes, uh, Baez does have five losses, but the only time, only a couple of those guys have beat him, like, convincingly, and the only guy that's ever stopped him is Navarrete. Now, look at Angelo. Angelo is not a renowned knockout puncher. He's got 11 knockouts in 24 fights. So he, he, he's got a sub-50% knockout ratio. But since the Polanco fight, which was his featherweight debut, he's 2-0 at featherweight with two knockouts. So he's 100% he's knockout ratio as a featherweight. If he knocks out Baez, what, what, what that tells me and what it should tell the boxing world is that he really isn't anywhere close to the fighter he was at 122. He's better, much better than uh, a much better fighter than he was at 122. And um, I think it's a very important fight for his career, right, guys? Because look, when you look at just the landscape at 122 or 126, I should say, I told you guys many, many times, 2022 is going to be the year of the featherweight division. And so far, the featherweight division has delivered us some really great fights. You know, Angelo versus Mike Planilla with the knockout, the body shot knockout. Komatar versus Ford in a classic world title fight. You know, Vanada Lopez giving Rhea Abbey a, 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 a serious beating. Um, what, am, what else am I missing? Nick Ball versus Ray Vargas in a, in a very competitive, uh, you know, controversial fight, but a, a fun fight, you know. So you look at it right now. So Angelo is currently ranked the number seven contender, as you got, I, as you guys can see highlighted there. He's number seven in the WBA, right? Um, Raymond Ford is a champion. They haven't updated this yet, but as of the last rankings, Raymond Ford is a champion. Komatov was one as per the last rankings. Komatov's going to drop down a little bit, right? You got Stephen Fulton at three, but he's already talked about potentially going up to 130. So we don't even know if Fulton's going to be a featherweight because he's talking about going to 130. Okay. You got the Argentinian Mirko Cuello at four. And then you got Victor Morales and Luis Nunez at five and six fighting each other. So, even though Angel's seven on paper, he's really already kind of he already, he's already a top five fighter in the division because Raymond Four is not going to be there much longer, if at all, because he's already talking about going up thirty because he can't make the weight anymore. So he 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 maybe stays up for one more fight and then then that then that belt goes vacant. Komatov, Komatov, it, it could be a, it, that could be a potential fight for Angelo. Obviously, the the fight that would really be great for him is, is the Stephen Four rematch because um, I think Angelo has grown a lot since that fight and. Stephen Fulton has proven himself as well to be one of the top fighters in the world. Or he could fight the winner of uh, Victor Morales versus Luis Nunez in the um, in a final el eliminator. And then if he wins that, maybe it's a world title shot. If not that fight, then maybe he winds up. I mean, look, he's 13 in the IBF. We know that Luis Venado Lopez is the world champion in the IBF. 
So that could also be a fight. So I'm looking at either the full and rematch, the Bernardo Lopez wall title shot, or Vic, the winner of Victor Morales versus Luis Nunez for fights for Angelo Leo if he beats Baez. You can't overlook Baez. Baez is tough. Ba Baez fights everybody tooth and nail. But I'm going to tell you guys this, man. I saw Angelo spar Kermel Mo when I was in Vegas. I saw him spar a lot of fighters. And he, people people think when I talk about him that I'm just being biased and because he's my friend. But look, look, I know a lot of fighters personally in the featherweight division. Like, I know Dominique Francis, who, just just to show you guys the rankings again. I know Dominique Francis, who's number eight, just ranked behind Angelo Leo. And you guys don't hear me going on about Dominique Francis being a guy to be in a way or any of these kind of things. Good good fighter, still needs a lot of work. But, you know, I know I know Dominique. I know Shushu Carrington. I'm telling y'all, um, he's won a world title, and he's been champion, and he's beaten some pretty good fighters, and really he's beat these guys with maybe 60% of his skills. And and the full on fight, he had an off night. You know, he he kind of got away from his game plan. It happens. It happens to it, it can happen to any fighter, right? But he's grown since that fight. He's beginning world class. But I'm I'm really really excited about this fight. People ask me all the time. They say BT True School. Who's the what's the fight that you're most excited for? And I've been saying it, I couldn't say who the opponent was, but now that it's out there, the fight I've been most excited about in boxing is this fight because Baez always brings it, Baez always comes to fight. And I really feel in the core of my bones and the depths of my heart that Angel Leo is not just one of the best fighters in the featherweight division, but as he's putting it together now, he's gonna prove himself over time to be one of the best fighters in the world. So uh, he wins this fight. I'm thinking he's either getting and he's he, he's either gonna get an eliminator against somebody above him in the rankings, or he's getting a world title shot at, like, Venado Lopez, something like that. That That's what's going to be in the cards for him. So I'm I'm really excited about um his future and, and going to that fight. So it should be fun. Melo, Melo's over here. He got, he, he's got his panties in a bunch. He says, keep being a fan of Cokehead who just talks trash, thinking that they deserve something they haven't earned. What are you talking about? I'm not even a Benavidez fanboy like that. Bro, how are you going to say he never earned it? He was he was the youngest super middleweight champion in history. Yeah, he, we, we know he did coke. We know he was a fat ass. We know he was undisciplined. I've already said all that in the in the past. But he he's been, he was there for years. He beat plenty of you know good fighters like Caleb Plant, common opponent. Um, beat um, Andre, a guy Canelo really didn't show any interest in fighting. So you can't really say he didn't deserve it. He he did deserve it. And I'm not even no big ben Benavidez fan like that. But, um, you know, to give it to Munguia, who really – Munguia has never even been a real world champion. Munguia has never actually beat somebody. Munguia has never actually beat somebody who was champion at their actual, like, real weight. He beat Saddam Ali, who ran into a title because he fought an old Miguel Cotto, who was a smaller, blown-up uh, fighter. And he was the underdog in that fight. And credit to him, he won the fight. But he was he was ridiculous. And he just decided to um, stay at the weight. And he got his ass whooped. But, like, he's never been – like, he's never, ever been a real world champion. So the fact that you're co-signing what Canelo is doing, it shows that you have this man – you're a fanboy. You're calling me a fanboy. You're the fanboy. You're, you're, you're projecting. I'm indifferent. I don't – I'm not no Canelo fanboy. I'm not no Benavidez fanboy. I've even said it many times before in the past. I give two fucks about Benavidez versus Canelo. I'm glad Benavidez is a 175-pounder. I'm glad he's going to fight guys close to his size. I'm glad that there's a possibility we, we might get Benavidez versus better be ever Bibble. Those fights excite me a lot more than him fighting, you know, a guy that turned pro at welterweight, you know, when it was a smaller fighter. If he were to beat up on Canelo Alvarez, to me, it's not impressive. Stop lying. Uh, you don't even go to Mexico. When was the last time you went lying? They don't even like him a little more, so I know you're lying. <laughs> yeah, tell him. Tell him, Al. Tell him. And then Hyro says, Al the Pow. Um, Al the Pow. Um, Dominique Francis, he's saying. He can fight Dominique Francis? I mean, yeah, I mean, Dominique Francis is eight, Angelo seven. So, in theory, they could fight. It's not a fight I personally want to see just because... I'm cool. I'm really cool. Both of them. And I think Dominique needs, I need some, I think he needs some work before he fights Angelo. Just, just honestly, like my honest assessment. I, I think he, he still got some room to grow. I don't think he's ready for that kind of a fight yet, but um, I, I hope, I hope he stays active and, and gets the right fights to be ready for a fight of that magnitude. But I don't think, I don't think his handlers will put him in there with Angelo right now. 
Luis Nunez ain't going to the WBA route. Yes, he is. He's fighting Victor Morales. That's his next fight. He is going to the WBA route. But shout out to everyone here, man. Uh, it's your boy BT, the Untouchable True School Sports Empire. I just, I ran through everything I wanted to run through. I, I, I spoke my piece on Canelo's comments. I've, I've talked about Vakel Navarrete. I've talked about Crawford a little bit, getting his uh, star on the Walk of Fame. Talked about Angelo Leo fighting, finally, them finally announcing his fight that I've known about for like a month. Um, so y'all can ask whatever y'all want. We, we, we're at that part of the live where y'all can just ask whatever you want. I'll stay on for like 10 to 15 more minutes. And then we'll uh, we'll get up on out of here. Will William Zapata fight Shakur Stevenson? Um, that all depends on, I think, Bob, you know, Zan for promotions and what they want to do with William Zapata. Um, I think that's a fight Top Rank will be very interested in because they're going to be eager to put Shakur Stevenson in, in there with a fighter who has a, uh, a, a kind of style that is fan friendly. Williams Peta is a fan friendly fighter, you know, comes forward, throws a lot of punches. But um, I don't see why he, I, I, I honestly don't see what why they would avoid Shakur Stevenson even more because Zapata has already blown through everybody they put in front of him. He's proved, he's shown that he's 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 ready to fight for a world title. Why not put him in there with Shakur Stevenson and make a make a, a really intriguing matchup for the for the boxing world? A lot of people say Shakur Stevenson runs. They say he's not tough. They I've had people, people message me on Instagram telling me saying BT you're crazy. Shakur Stevenson is a wimp. Williams Pitt is going to end Shakur Stevenson. So it, I don't even think the ball is really in Shakur Stevenson's core or top rank. I think it's really, it falls more upon Zanfer, Golden Boy, and Zapata. You know. Uh, they want to know Estrada versus Bam. Yeah, they're they're close to finalizing a deal from what I've been reading. I think the date I've been reading is uh, June 29th in Arizona. So they're not they, they have I haven't seen the official official announcement from Matchroom Boxing or Eddie Hearn. But it, it looks like that's what we're, that's the fight we're going to get. Obviously it's a great fight. I um I applaud if it's true. I applaud Guy Estrada for doing what Canelo and a lot of fighters in boxing these days refuse to do, which is the fact that he's taking a passing of the torch fight. Passing of the torch fights are looked down upon in boxing these days. But the thing is, it's only a passing of the torch fight if the younger fighter can actually take the torch from the older fighter. So he, he, he's he been very adamant. He doesn't think that Bam is as great as people advertise. And he wants to prove to the world that that he is still good enough to beat the guys like Bam Rodriguez, that the, that the old – the old lion is still, you know, got enough in the tank to beat the Bams of the world. So it, it, it'll be a good fight. I know it'll sell well. They can put it in the Arizona. Um, a lot of Mexicans will come out there. And, uh, yeah, I ain't mad at that. That's not a passing of the torch. It is a passing of the torch because it's a passing of the torch because we know that Roma Gonzalez isn't going to fight. We know that Roma Gonzalez isn't going to fight Bam because the whole second promotion is dynamic. So it is a passing of the torch fight. Guy Estrada, right there, Roman Gonzalez, is the best of that era from that weight class. So it is a passing of the torch fight because we know he's not fighting Roman Gonzalez. Beat, uh, Enrique wants to know, was Dominique Francis' last fight in the UK? No. His last fight was actually in Argentina where he fought a fighter named – I got it right here. He fought a fighter named Brian Ariel Arguello, who was 6-2. And he won like a WBA regional title. And that's what got him in the rankings. And that was back in June of last year. And he hasn't fought since then. So um, they need to get him back in the ring soon. Is it safe to say that Canelo is scared of Dea Benavidez? I mean, I, I, I ain't mad at it, honestly. I mean, he, he's acting like it. People want to say he's not scared of him. Canelo's not afraid. He's not ducking. I mean, then, then how, do you, how do you reconcile him asking for $200 million? That's not that's not courageous behavior. I'll tell you that. You know, you, you can sit there and say what you think, but that's not the behavior of somebody who's courageous. That's that's the behavior of somebody who's reluctant. You know, reluctancy is a symptom of, you know, not having confidence, unbelief. So yeah, those things all stem from being scared of the outcome, scared of the backlash or what people might say if he loses to Benavidez. You know, scared of the perception of who he is in Mexican boxing. How is Canelo versus Munguia not a passing of the torch? 
I never said Canelo versus Munguia was a passing of the torch. I I was talking about Guile versus Bam. Valdez versus Liam Wilson is for a title fight. Um, I haven't heard anything about that, but maybe it is. Maybe you're right. He said if they pay that he will fight him, um, that he's a prize fighter. Y'all clap for Floyd when he did it. Floyd never asked. Come on, man. Floyd, Floyd never asked. Um, stop, bro. Please stop. Stop. Like, I know Floyd wasn't no perfect. I know Floyd pulled his fair share of bullshit. 200 million? Come on, man. Stop. Reluctance is moving to 175 for Vosic. You can thank Samson for that. Well, look, I've, I've had plenty of things to say about Samson over the years of Benavidez's boxing career. But I do think that they wanted to fight. I think that they didn't want to fight Canelo. Why, why, why would they not want to fight Canelo? Canelo was the biggest money fight they could, they could, they could make. That's not reluctance. That's frustration. That's, that's years of Canelo saying that, he, that he's not going to fight you. Because you talk a certain way about him, and you're not stroking his ego like the the Smiths and the the John Riders and the Saunders of the world and the Munguias now, you know. Gaio beats Bam and Ch listen. I'll tell you this: if Gaio, if Gaio beats Bam, man. There is an argument you can make about Gaio Estrada being the best of, from that weight class of his era. Because one thing I'll say about Gaio, as much as I am a Roman Gonzalez fan, I mean, I, got, I, I proudly have the Chocolatito headband hanging proudly on the wall. My favorite fighter of all time, right? I think that, you know, he beat Gaio in two of the three fights, even though on paper it, it doesn't say that. The fact that Gaio Estrada has never, ever, he's beaten every man he's ever stepped foot in the ring with. Like, nobody can ever say they got one over on Gaio Estrada. So that, that, that's a big plus on his end. It's kind of like Lennox Lewis. Lennox Lewis had some losses, but everyone that he fought and that he lost to, he avenged all of them. He avenged Rockman. He avenged, you know, uh, Oliver McCall, right? So some some fighters like like Canelo and Roman Gonzalez and you know, um, there's plenty of fighters out there that 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 are viewed to be greater than Guile that can't even claim that, right? So that, that's a big plus on his end. But I'm gonna tell you like this: if he if he beat if he somehow at his advanced age coming off of all the all, all that inactivity, if he beats Bam Rodriguez, I think, as much as I hate to say it, that would be what, what, what would actually put him above, clearly put him above Roma Gonzalez. But just being unbiased, if he beats Bam Rodriguez at this age, that puts him above Roma Gonzalez. I think. As much as I love Chocolatito. Canelo owes David. The people that make him rich are Mexican-Americans. He fights in the USA arena and gets full of Mexican-Americans. His interviews are mostly Mexican-Americans. He owes a Mexican-American a fight, and you're, 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 you're spot on. You know, Canelo, I know he's proud of his Mexican heritage, and, and you, should be proud, you, you should be proud of your Mexican heritage. Mexican culture is amazing. They got great music, great food. There's a lot to be proud of being Mexican, but, you know, he ain't really fought Mexico too many times. You know, he had to, he had to be freaking badgered to fight John Ryder in Mexico. But he's fought in Vegas. He's fought in Texas. He's fought in, you know, in Miami here one time. And I've been to Canelo fights. And you're correct. A lot of the people there are Mexican Americans that speak less Spanish than I do. So you're you're 100 right about that. Do you think Benavidez can beat Bivol after Better BF knocks him out? I think the Bivol fight is the more winnable fight for him. I think Bivol is obviously a, a very skilled boxer and he's got great feints and he's long and he's got the best, some of the best footwork in the game. And he transitions from offense to defense very well and defense to offense very well. So seamlessly, there's, there's a lot of pluses with Bivol, but Benavidez's combination of volume, physical strength, stamina, those could all prove to be very big problems for Bivol. Now, Bivol has fought fighters that had those, those attributes before like Zoro Ramirez, but I don't think Zoro Ramirez is as, is as crafty um, or has the hand speed of a guy like Benavidez. So that's that's where I think it's, the, it's a different kind of a matchup. But um, look, Benavidez against either one of the two, whether it's better BF or Bevel, are great fights for boxing. And to me, as far I'm not from a money standpoint, we know Canelo is the money fight, but from a like box from a boxing standpoint, just pure boxing standpoint, the tougher fights are those two fighters, not Canelo. Um, let me see. 
Roman Gonzalez is a beast. He should try to win, win one, more, one, one more title and do a fourth Gaio fight. Um, I'm good on the. I mean, I'm not going to be. I'm good on the fourth Gaio fight. Um, I want to. I, I want to see Roman Gonzalez win a, a, a champion in the uh, in, in at 118. You know, I've been told by people on his team, and the reports have been out there that Roman Gonzalez is going to move to 118 and try to fight one of the champions there. Now, if I had to. If I had to take a guess as to which champion at 118 he'd probably fight to win the 118 title and become a five division champion, because there's, there's only been about six or seven five division champions in box history. Only the who's who of boxing ever ever become five division champions, like Pacquiao, Mayweather, Hearns, Leonard, um, Duran, um, De La Hoya, and I think that's about it. So he, I think he'd be the seventh, the seventh or the eighth five division champion, and um. In boxing history, I think he fights Emmanuel, Emmanuel Rodriguez because I don't think he fights Takuma Inoue because it, uh, I believe Takuma Inoue has some sort of affiliation with Tekken promotions and their fighters don't fight each other, right? Um, and even then, I think there's, they're, they're going to take Takuma Inoue in a different direction, maybe try to steer him towards Junta Nakatani. Junta Nakatani is too dangerous for Roman Gonzalez at this stage of his career, so he's not going to do that fight. So I think it'll either be Maloney or it'll be Emmanuel Rodriguez. It'll be one of those two guys. What do you guys think about that? Explain to me why you think Benavidez is a better fight than Munguia. He is a better fighter than Jaime Munguia. Defensively, he's a better fighter. Throws more punches than Jaime Munguia. Physically stronger than Jaime Munguia. Um, accomplished more in boxing than Jaime Munguia. Beat better fighters than Jaime Munguia. I'm saying all this as a guy that is not no Benavidez fanboy, but he's just better than Jaime Munguia. Um, Jaime Munguia has extremely leaky defense. And luckily for him, his matchmakers have done a great job of picking opponents that could hit him, but had no power to keep him off. You know, Jimmy Kelly. Um, those kind of Jimmy Kelly. Demetrius Ballard, Weight Drain, Gabe Rosado, you know. And I, I, look, I know you can nitpick any fighter's resume, but um, Munguia is one of the most overrated fighters in boxing. As, mu as, mu as much as I'll say about Canelo, I at least Canelo is actually a top, like, elite, elite fighter, creme de la creme fighter. Munguia is not in that class, and he's going to find out very badly when they fight me fourth that he's not in that class. It's going to be a bad uh, rude awakening for him. And I'm gonna tell you this. I'm, I'm gonna say it like this. I, I ain't no Canelo fan like that. But if he loses to Jaime Munguia, oh my God, then I, I, I'm really, really gonna have a lot to say because he shouldn't be losing to, to the Jaime Munguias of the world. Jaime Munguia is not in Canelo's class. What do you think of Eduardo Sugar Nunez? I love Eduardo Sugar Nunez. Eduardo Sugar Nunez is, a, is an amazing fighter, one of the most exciting fighters in Mexican boxing today. Joe Cordina needs to. Stop ducking him. Joe Cordina needs to fight him. He's the mandatory challenger. Uh, he's a matchroom fighter, just like Joe Cordina is a matchroom fighter. So I'm looking at you, Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn, you got to go ahead and you got to make Joe Cordina versus Sugar Nunez. There's no other fight to make in the 130 division for uh, Joe Cordina. Joe Cordina didn't want to fight Oshaki Faza because they said the money wasn't right. Boring fight, this, that, and the third. Okay, well, well, you can't say that with Sugar Nunez. Sugar Nunez... He's got that thump in both hands. He brings the pain. I, I love Sugar Nunez. In in a way, he should have been five division world champion already if he didn't skip flyweight. But look, people don't like when I bring it up, all right? And I'm gonna bring it up since since you brought it up. I'm gonna bring it up. There's we 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 all know why he didn't he, he didn't become flyweight champion. And that right there, you see that name? That man right there was at flyweight when in a way did did that. He was at 108. Roma Gonzalez is at 112. He went from 108, skipped Roma Gonzalez at 115, or one at, at 112, I should say, and went to 115. So um, it's unfortunate, but but you're right. He should have been five division champion already, but he didn't want to go up there because had he went up there, he would have been really, really pressed to fight Roma Gonzalez. And maybe Ohashi promotions, they weren't confident in him at that particular time. And look. We, we, we can sit here and we can all have our preconceived notions, but it's worked out. He's become four division champion, international superstar in boxing, multi-million dollar fighter, one of the faces of boxing. So, you know, it worked out.
Shout out to Corey Lee Boxing. What's good, man? Good to see you. Hope all is well. All of 112 ducked Inoue. How? He never competed there. How could they duck him? He never competed there. Now, you're going to say Roman Gonzalez ducked Inoue, which is not true. Roman Gonzalez never got paid. Like Since, since, since we're going to talk about money, Roman Gonzalez, when, when Roman Gonzalez and Inoue were negotiating the fight the first time, before he fought Rungvisai, all he wanted was a $1 million payday. That's all they had to do was just meet the demand of a $1 million payday, which I think was fair. He had, at that point, he had already proven to be a four-division champion, lineal champion, and he was literally the pound-for-pound pound king of boxing. So he earned a $1 million payday, all right? People always talk about Roman Gonzalez not fighting him because they wouldn't meet his financial demands. But they don't talk about when Roman Gonzalez called out in a way, I believe it was New Year's Eve of 2014, before before uh, Inoue fought Omar Narvaez, Roman Gonzalez said, I would like to fight the winner of Inoue versus Omar Narvaez. And, um, you know, the fight never happened. You know, in, Inoue shouldn't even have moved up to, to 115 because you had, at, at the time when he went up to 115 from 108, you had Roman Gonzalez, who was champion. You had, I think, um, Casimiro was in the division. Young, young, strong, John Riel, Casimiro. I'm not saying he would have beat him, but, you know, it's a tough, tough fight, you know. That's when he was actually disciplined and was really – so, look, it, it, it paid off. You know, that's why you have managers and promoters because they guide the careers. Guy was Strada was there. I mean, so, you know, it, it wasn't just Roman – it was Gaio, it was Casimiro, it was Roman Gonzalez. So, look, in a way, being plenty of good fighters. I'm not going to hate on him and nitpick on him, but it was brought up in the chat and, uh, yeah. People, people always play like to downplay Romo Gonzalez. I love how you see him biased, bro, but I don't think you realize how big this fight is. No, I okay. I'm not. I'm not from Mexico, all right. I'm not Mexican, so I know it's gonna sell here in America. It's gonna. It's it's gonna be just like Chavez versus Canelo was, maybe even more. You know, it's gonna be on that same level because I remember when Chavez fought Canelo, I didn't give. A rat's ass about Charles versus Canelo, but I remember it being one of Canelo, Canelo's most successful pay-per-views. They did like one million buys or something like that. It was a big commercial success. Sold out. They did a big gate. Fight was trash, but the fight was a, a success. So I'm I'm thinking it's probably it's probably gonna be something on that level. But um I'm speaking from the I'm speaking from the perspective of an American, I guess. Someone that's been he, I'm here every day on YouTube. I've been yelled at by so many boxing fans for saying, BT, how could you not want to see Benavides versus Canelo? And it wasn't that I'd never wanted to see Benavides versus Canelo. It was that, number one, I never thought Canelo was really serious about wanting to fight him because I know Canelo's history. And two, I want to see Benavides fight guys his size. So thank the Lord he's going to be at light heavyweight fighting guys close to his size. Uh, true school, just to let you know, Johnny Boy just got three years. Three years. Wow, that sucks. Does anybody? I've been hearing about it. Does anybody know? Like, maybe it's not my business. But what? What did he? What did he go to? Um, the slammer for? Why, why is he in there for three years? Now, shout out to him. You know, hope all is well. I'll be praying for him. May have to write him a letter or something like that. I remember when guy was trying to was the unified champion at one twelve. Why did Roma Gonzalez not fight him? The same reason he didn't fight in a way. He was literally the number one fighter in boxing. He wanted a certain amount of money, which was not unreasonable. He wanted a million dollar payday, which for a guy that accomplished with the accomplished, I think it's fair to say he earned that. And they wouldn't meet it. I remember I, I remember making the video about it. It's on the channel still from way back then. But guess what? He still fought him a second and a third time. When they finally met his men, when Roman Gonzalez got financially um, compensated uh, properly, and Guile did too, they fought. So follow the money. Old charges. He went. Yeah, I seen a video. I I seen I seen a video where he was like, I guess his cousin had the phone, and he was like recording him talking through the phone. So hey man, um. We all have things we battle with in life. You know, I, my prayers go out to him. And uh, 
You just gotta make you gotta make real you gotta make real sound decisions. You gotta have uh sound decision making skills. Gaio and Roman were the real ones. I mean, the, yeah, exactly. Like that, and the NOA fanboys don't like when I say it, but it's the truth. In a way, would have became a star in his own right because he's a great fighter. Like I'm not saying he wouldn't have became a great, a big star. I'm not saying he wouldn't have um, made it and became a multi million dollar fighter. He would have, but Roman Gonzalez and him fighting on HBO and you know headlining shows and selling tickets, he he blazed the trail. He set the stage. He made the lower weights popping again in a way where. It wasn't popping since the days of Michael Carbajal and Chiquita Gonzalez and Danny Romero and Johnny Tapia, you know? That's the truth. And people don't like it. The NOA fanboys, they don't like it. Tank's resume doesn't matter. He doesn't care for Bell's legacy. It's just about the dollar. Yeah, his. I mean, obviously, I, I like Tank, but, you know, he, he does need to start – Fighting some legacy fights against the people, the guys that people want to see him fight. You know, I, I think the Frank Warren fights a step in the right direction, but um, it's it still ain't the fights that people are asking for. So I'm I'm with you on his resume. You know. So guys, we're one we're one hour and twenty one minutes in. We'll we'll go we'll go to the hour and a half mark. We'll make it a, a even ninety minutes, and then we'll uh we'll get up on out of here. But uh, shout out to everybody who's still here rocking with your boy BT. The Untouchable True School Sports Empire, you know, really appreciative for everybody that's tuned in to hearing me ramble about Benavidez and Canelo and Munguia, and I guess now Romo Gonzalez and Inouye and Gallo, you know. If Canelo knocks on Munguia, will that do anything for his legacy? Um, maybe for his legacy amongst Mexican fans, because Munguia is, you know, Mexican native. He's a star over there in Mexico. For me, though, like for me personally, it, it don't do anything for me. Munguia, Munguia is overrated to me. Um, Munguia's already lost in my eyes. Munguia, Munguia lost to Dennis Hogan. So that's where I'm at with that. But um, hopefully it's a good fight. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to hate on the event. I want, I want the event to do well. I want to, uh, I want the fight to be great. I want, I want everything to be a success because I do care about boxing. Uh, BT, do you think Inoue can become the champion 126 unified undisputed? I mean, look, he's a great fighter. He's capable of uh, doing anything. But I'm gonna tell you guys this right now: if you think if you think 126 is gonna be the cakewalk that bantamweight was, or even the cakewalk that 122 has become, it's, it's not gonna be like that. There's there's more heat at 126. The guys are bigger. They're stronger. They're, they're, they're more skillful than the guys he's been fighting. So, um, not ruling it out. But I just think it's going to be very tough for him. You got Espinoza, you got uh, Bruce Carrington, you got uh, you know if Steve. I mean, I think he'll beat Stephen Fulton again. But you got Stephen Fulton there. You got Angelo Leo. You got um, you got what's called? You got Nick Ball. You got some good fights. I mean, and it's and it's different looks. It's, it's different types of fighters. It's not just one specific fighter. I feel like a lot of these guys that. 122 and even 118. A lot of these guys really weren't punching like that. Just not not not, not the downplay. I mean, Donaire could punch at 18. I'll give him Donaire, but like, you know, uh, who is it? Who's fighting Nary? Nary can punch a little bit. Um, Fulton's not a Fulton's not a puncher. Paul Butler's not a puncher. But these guys are 26. The Espinosas and the Carringtons, even the Angelo Leos. Of the world. These, guys, these guys can actually punch at that weight, so they can punch. They got. Different types of skills. I, I I think I I I everyone thinks he's just gonna breeze through 26. I, I don't I don't think so. I think I think 26 ends up being uh to date the toughest role for him. It's not a boxing question, but have you seen the new balance Sh Shohei Otani logo? Does baseball finally have that Michael Jordan star that it was desperately starving for? He's definitely the biggest star baseball's had in years. Um Shohei Otani. I'm a bit of a uh, – I've become a little bit of a Shohei Otani hater just because he joined the Dodgers. And, and outside of the New York Mets in baseball, there's no team in baseball that I despise more than the Los Angeles Dodgers. I think that I think the Los Angeles Dodgers is one of the most overrated sports franchises in all of sports. Um, and, they're, and they're in the National League, right? So they're kind of like they're – not, they're not like in our division, but like they're, they're, they're kind of in close proximity to the Marlins. So 
you know, it is what it is. But, um, yeah, with him going to a big team like the Dodgers, they, he's a big star. Um, and all he's got to do is perform. I'll tell you this. If, if the Dodgers don't win the World Series and Shohei Otani does not have a World Series by the end of this year, you guys think Canelo got exposed? You think you think Canelo got exposed? Man, I may have to make a video about baseball. That's how bad it would be because that, that team is ridiculous. Um, BT, do you have a live reaction of Fulton versus Inouye? I want to see your reaction. Yeah, I do. Go go look it up. Um, it was, you know, I think I went back and I watched it. I went back and I watched it like a month ago. And when I watched it, I was like, man, I was I was I was giving Stephen Fuller a little too much credit for like nothing. I don't know why I was trying to give Stephen Fuller credit, but um, it was a damn near perfect performance. It was a great performance. Apollo wants to know: Is Angel Leo ranked in the top ten in his division? Not only is he ranked in the top ten, he's one of the most active fighters in the division. He 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 made his featherweight debut in November. He fought in November. He fought in late January, and he's fighting again in uh, April. So three fights in five months. One of the most active fighters um, at the world class level in boxing. Look, you said is he ranked? Right now, he's ranked number seven in the WBO. He's ranked number thirteenth in the IBF. So he's ranked in he's ranked in two of the four sanctioning bodies. He's active. He's having impressive performances. Everybody he's fought that they put in front of him so far in the featherweight division. He's knocked them out. He's and, and he and he's shown better boxing skills at featherweight. So I, people are always going to say I'm biased for Angelo, and to a degree, I I, I know I am. But um, he's a, he's a hell of a fighter, and I do think that he is very improved from the guy that fought Stephen Fulton and Aaron Alameda. And I would just implore, and I, I would encourage every and everybody to, to to please tune in April 10th on Pro Box when he fights Eduardo Baez. Um, because I think he's going to put on an absolute um, performance for the for the boxing fans and for the for the, for the featherweight division. Why didn't maybe the promotions have him inactive? They had him inactive because I mean I don't want to put his business out there. It's not my business to, to, to really like put it out there. But he's not with them no more, so I can talk about it a little bit. They they had him inactive because they just uh, weren't seeing eye to eye on um, you know the direction of his career, like. He wanted to fight certain fighters. They didn't want to. They wanted to lowball him on a lot of offers, and and they just put him on the shelf. They got they got tired of him. And they just put him on the shelf, and he 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 became an afterthought for the for the company after the Aaron Alameda fight. So basically, he wound up sitting out the rest of his contract, which literally from the Alameda fight to like early to like it was like a year and some change. He sat out on on general principle, and in that time he sat out, he just sparred guys like Shakur Stevenson and, and, and Donaire and Marlon Tapalis and just sharpen those skills up. And that's why he's having all these impressive performances now. But uh, they just they just weren't seeing eye to eye. And it happens. Is Angelo Leo a slick boxer or is he more of a puncher boxer? Um, I think he's a very versatile fighter. I think um, I don't want to like – get too deep into uh, his style because there's some things that there's some things that I've seen him do in the gym. I'm going to say like, there, there's some things I've seen him do in the gym that he's never done in fights. So if you've only watched his fights, there's going to be some things that I've seen him do that I know you guys haven't seen him do. So if I sat here, if I sat here and I told you some of the things he's done in the gym, you would say, nah, BT, you don't know. Uh, he, he, he doesn't fight that way. He, he doesn't do those things. You would think I'm like talking out of my ass. So I'm going to wait for him to fight. And if he breaks out, what I what I've seen him do in the gym, I, I will acknowledge it. But um, I would say he's a at his core, he is a volume puncher, pressure fighter, e elite condition fighter, with really good angles. Um, at featherweight though, at, at one twenty six, where he's more filled out and he's not making as much of a weight cut, and he's and he, and he feels stronger. I do think he is he's more of a boxer puncher. At one twenty two, he was more of a swarmer. You know, like when he fought Jermaine Williams, he was very much a guy that got on the inside and just let his hands go and threw flurries. At 126, he's shown himself to be more of a boxer puncher, a guy that has the capabilities to actually hurt you with one punch, as we saw with Mike Planilla. So I would say he leans more towards boxer puncher at 126. At 122, he was more of a pressure fighter swarmer. But he's a he's a very well-rounded fighter, and people are going to see that as he continues to develop and fight more often. 
Um, how do you rank the junior welterweight class? Also, tell me on trend, but don't you think the TO, if TO fights whoever, including Henny and Tank, all his fights are wild cards. He can't can he can win any big fight. TO Fima Lopez is, is one of the most hardest fights to predict going into a fight because he's either gonna look like trash or he's gonna look like one of the best fighters in boxing. And there's no in-between. And I guess that keeps things that keeps things interesting. But as far as 140, 140 has a lot of talent. 140 has you know, obviously the big names like T.O. and and and, and, and uh, Devin Haney and now with the emergence of Subruma T.S. You got those guys. But then you got guys like maybe some of the contenders like people don't talk about. You got guys like, um, you know, I like Ergashev and you got guys like uh, unknown guys like Steve Claggett. And, you know, it, it, it's a good weight class. 140 generally is always a solid weight class. You got Richard Hitchens, Kenneth Sims, uh, Isak Cruz, Gary Anton Russell, Josh Taylor still there for now. Liam Paro, Gustavo Lemos, Arnold Barbosa Jr. A lot of high quality um, operators at 140. I, I like 140. 140, I would say, is one of my top three or four weight classes that I like in the, in the boxing. You know? How painful is is uh, boxing sparring? It, it 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 all depends, man. It all, it all depends on how much punishment you take. But look, man, you get you, if you get in there with somebody who know, who knows what they're doing. Boxing is a sport of pain, and the 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 better sparring you get, the higher quality of the ass whooping is. And you know, at, getting your ass whooped in the boxing ring is good for you because it it helps get you better, it helps keep you sharp. And it helps um, make you a better person and a better fighter. So uh, it's it's not about how painful it is. It's about how you deal with the pain. That, that That's really the most important thing. But it, it can be very painful, you know? Are you trying to say Angelo could actually be a pound-pound fighter or just great in his division? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely saying he could be a pound-pound fighter for sure. Um, he, he just has to get the fights and win the fights. Um the only, look, the only loss he's had in his career is to Stephen Fowen. And if you go back and you watch the early parts of that fight, he buzzed Stephen Fowen pretty badly. Um, he just got away from some things in his game plan. I know his game plan because I've talked to him about it. Um, and, you know, you, you learn from these things as, as you get older. Fighters are entitled to progress and regress. And I feel like he's progressed in a major way. And he's been showing it in his last two fights on Pro Box. You just got to go, go back and watch the fights. And I feel I fight the better the opponents are, the more he's going to show, and you're going to see over time. Um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking this fight, Bias will be a tough fight. Bias, Bias, it, it, you know, he comes to fight, he comes to win. The only guy that ever really stopped him is Navarrete. So if Angelo can do the same thing, then he, that's that's a that, that's a feather on his cap. And then um, I'm thinking that either leads him into an elim eliminator or will a title fight. Um, and yeah, I, I think he's got the talent. And I'm gonna tell you why. I, I, I want to. It's not as much a talent, guys, because talent in boxing. What I've learned over the years is talent can only get you so far in boxing. You know, when, when you get to that world class level, the top twenty, top twenty five, you know, top fifteen, top ten, top five, the eliminator, the championship level. All these guys are good. Everyone is good. You don't get there on accident, just being talented. All right, you gotta have something about you. And so it's the littlest things that separate the guys that become multi-divisional multi champions, pound for pound guys. I feel like with him, I've been around a lot of fighters, a lot. I mean, a lot of fighters. I don't think, I have never met a fighter in my life that loves the sport of boxing like Angelo Leo. Eats, sleeps, shits. He's literally obsessed with the sport of boxing. That's why he's improving, and that's why I think he's going to be two-division champion by the end of this year. And that's why I feel like he's going to get a lot of big fights. He's going to be a factor. And people are just going to keep saying that I'm being a fanboy and he's my friend, but, I mean, he ain't the only guy I know in 26. And you, don't hear, you, don't, you guys don't hear me talking up Dominique Francis, and, he, and he's from South Florida. So, um, yeah, I think the world of him, honestly. Um, one of the most underrated fighters in the sport. Yeah, he was he was taunting the hell out of me. I was gassed. I was I was gassed when he um when he taunted in a way. Uh, what if Tank fought Lomachenko now? Has that fight lost its luster? Not to me. I I think Lomachenko versus Tank is a great fight still. Lomachenko showed even even at at his advanced age that he's still one of the top lightweights in boxing. He's gonna be champion again. I think he's more than likely gonna beat George Cambosis Jr. 
I would love to see Tank fight Lomachenko, even still. Um, is it? I think it might even be a bigger fight now because Tank is a bigger star in boxing now. Lomachenko was a, a bigger star. Now it might actually be a bigger fight now than it was then. So to me, it hasn't lost its luster. I think it's a fight that they should actually go ahead and look to explore. I would love it. If they said tomorrow, Javante Davis is fighting Lomachenko, I would be gassed. Honestly. Uh, what's Usyk's legacy fight if he beats Tyson Fury? Um, if he beats Tyson Fury, obviously that, I mean, he's literally cements himself as the Evander Holyfield of our era. Um, he, he's been undisputed at cruiserweight, undisputed at heavyweight. The only other guy that's done that is Evander Holyfield. So he literally does the Evander Holyfield. That, that's his legacy in the sport. Being a, a gold medal, you know, those kind of things. Um, BT, I don't think there was a big boxing event this week. The only boxing event that I know of is Jose Zapata versus Dalton Smith, which I have a mild interest in that fight because, um, I, I actually set up some sparring when I was in LA for Jose Zapata and my good buddy, Eric Lances Jr. And so I, I just, I just seen Zapata. I, I interviewed him. He sparred one of my friends and, um, so that, 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 that's what kind of has me a bit intrigued in the fight. You know, Zapata is a true warrior of the sport. This is a do or die fight for him. And, and, you know, with, with a guy like, uh, Dalton Smith, Dalton Smith's one of these guys where I'm like, you know what, like, how good is he really? I've, I've never really seen, I, I've seen him fight one time, but he didn't necessarily ooh me, ooh and ah me. So, you know, if I, if I don't remember too much about him when I saw him fight, he mustn't have been not that good, you know? So that's kind of how I'm taking it with, with, with Dalton Smith. We got our first Super Chat alive, and it's better late than never. Uh, shout out to my guy, D4, again. He says, my brother, what's good? You know I got to ask, but pop Dukes and tell him to smash the like button. Yeah, l listen to my man, D4, and follow his example. Contribute. Pay your tithes. Pay your tithes to the Church of Boxing, True School Sports. We're live and in full effect here. Um, let's, uh, as far as Pops, Pops is asleep. You know, and I, and I know for a fact that Pops is dead asleep because I've been talking for almost 100 minutes straight. And he he and I told him to come in here if he, if he wakes up. He still ain't came in here yet. So Pops is asleep. But it's good to see you, man. I, um, I ran through a lot. Ran through Canelo. Talked about Canelo. Talked about, you know, Navarrete fighting on, in San Diego on the 18th against Baranchik. They announced that today. Talked about Angelo Leo. They finally announced his fight April 10th on Pro Box against Eduardo Baez. So those, those, those to me are probably the the biggest stories in boxing today. But uh, how are you, man? How, how, how's life treating you? You know, F it. We're going to, you know what? We're, 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 guys, we're going to extend it to, we're going to make it a two hour live. Just, 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 just for the super chat, we'll make it a two hour live. We'll go into like 22 minutes just to make it even two hours. Because now that D4 showed up, I, I got to stay. I got to talk more. I got to keep it going. So you know, get your questions in, boxing and non-boxing related. And we'll uh, we'll run it for another 20 minutes. Um, Do you want to interview with John Fury? Uh, if we ever cross paths, I, I would love to interview John Fury. You know, I love John Fury. Uh, entertaining. You know, obviously he was a fighter back in his day. He fought Henry Akawande. He's obviously the, the father of Tyson Fury. Why not? You know, why not? I like John Fury. I've been locked up for a bar fight. That doesn't sound like that. And so I think Drunk Irishman said that Johnny got first degree of endangering safety. Damn. I mean, look, it is what it is, man. What are your favorite song lyrics in any song, BT? My favorite lyrics to any song. I mean, I, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of great songs. I, I, I listen to a lot of music. Um, there's this rap group from the '80s that most people don't know about called JVC, and they got this song called Stylin', and I, and I listen to it a lot. And there's a part of the song that I like where they said, "Uh, what they say? They said, when it comes to MCing, there will be none greater, because I'm the greatest. No, what, what they say? When it comes to MCing." There will be none greater because I'm the common denominator on the microphone. I forgot how it went, but um, th that song, if you listen to that song, there's a part in there when he says that. I, I like that song a lot. That's like one song I listen, to, I listen to today that I remember the lyrics to. But there's a lot. There's a lot of um, 
great songs out there. What did Jay-Z say? Jay-Z had, a, Jay-Z had a song called The Prelude. He said, I used to think rapping at 38 was ill, but last year alone I grossed 38 mil. My favorite fight ever? Oh, that's easy. R- Riddick Bowe, Evander Holyfield won. Hands down, my, my, my favorite fight of all time. BT, uh, is it true your favorite fight was KSI versus Tommy Fury? Absolutely not. <laughs> Hell no. I hate influencer boxing. You know? So every now and then, you know, they a lot of those guys don't got no defense. So you, you get some crazy knockouts, but uh, I'm not like the big I'm, – I'm a boxing purist. So for me – not a big, not big on the influence of boxing scene, but you know, it's got its place, got it's got its audience. D4 says, My brother, quick question. I'm really curious. John Gotti's son versus Jake Paul. I don't know why, but I'm thinking that'd be a good fight. Who do you think would win? That's a, that's a hell of a fight, actually. I never thought about that fight. Yeah, John Gotti the third. John Gotti fought Floyd. I think Jake Paul hit his ass. Jake Paul probably hit his ass and get him out of there. You know, John Gotti the third, from what I remember about that fight, because that fight was down here. Um, I think, I think, I, I think Jake Paul would get him out of there pretty quickly, actually, because I, I remember John Gotti just being real reckless, and he just didn't really have, like, any defense. He just, rugged guy, comes forward. I feel Jake Paul has learned enough boxing. He punches hard enough. He's physically strong enough. I think, uh, he, he would hit him. He would hit him with something big and, and knock him out. Does Don King have any world champions? Where are they? No, he doesn't. But he has this one fighter that I like a lot. I think he has – he's got one fighter. In his, and by the way, D4, thank you for the super chat. But um, does Don King have any world champions? He has one fighter that I, that I really, really like. That I think if he – if they if, if Don King Productions, if they really, really put their resources and their time and their energy towards – Making him a champion, I, I think he would have a good chance to become the champion. And that's uh, middleweight contender Ian Green. Um, they put him in tough. Um, he's like the number nine or seven ranked WBA contender. Um, I think he could beat the Lara Zarafa winner. But Don King P- Productions, I mean, they they want him to fight certain guys. You know, I, I've, been, I, I've been told who his next opponent is. It's not like an opponent that he should be fighting next. In my opinion, but they got their plans. I mean, I, I think I, I think Ian Green is one of the best middleweights in the world. He just needs to get that push. And I know from talking to him that he's done everything he can to try to get a world title shot, and it just hasn't gone his way. You know. And there's a lot of there's a lot of fighters that are that are that are like that. There's a lot of fighters that I know that are trying their damnness to get world title shots, but either they have a management team that doesn't fully believe in them. Or a promotional team that doesn't fully believe in them, or they're just on the wrong side of politics. And with him, I think it's I think it's the first. I think it's Don King Productions. They don't really see him as a priority, which is crazy because when you look at all the Don King fighters, I mean, Adrian Broner is not going to become a champion. Blair Cobbs is not going to become a champion. You know, Trayshawn Wiggins is good. I like Trayshawn Wiggins, but could he become a champion? I don't. I don't think he. I don't think he would be just because. Nah, I mean, nah, man. He, he needs to really improve a lot. So the only guy I really think in the Don King table that, that would have any shot at becoming a champion, in my opinion, would be Ian Green. Because middleweight isn't that good, and Ian Green could actually box. He can punch. He's tough. Like, he's got some things about him where in this middleweight division, he could beat a Michael Zarafa. He could beat a Lara. He just needs the opportunity. So, yeah, that, that's – right now he don't got no – he don't really got any, but, anybody, but – uh. Noel McCallion, thank you, Howard, for the correction. Apart from Noel McCallion, there's no other Don King champions, but um, I think Ian Green could become champion. Um, shout out to DB Boxing Fan for the uh for the five dollar super chat for the four nine nine cent super, super, super chat. He says, "I appreciate the content. Keep up the good work. I appreciate you guys. You know, today is it officially marks the the." We're two thirds of the way through the through the ninety days of boxing live uh, live fight series. You know, I told you guys on January twentieth, I was like, I was gonna give you a live every single day, and I haven't missed one day. Even when I was in Vegas, I didn't miss one day. Tired, you know, late, early, happy, sad, elated, depressed, still did the live. So uh, 
I'm practicing what I preach, and it's been very great for the channel. And yeah, man. Um, once these 90 days is over, though, probably gonna need a couple days off. But um, I'm enjoying every day. I feel like I'm I've grown a lot since we started this every day. Uh, since we started day one, and and I'm, and I'm sure I'm gonna grow more as a person in the channel from now until then. So thank you guys. Um. Um, starting the trend, brother. Let's get it, y'all. My man, wisdom cost me. Yeah, beat. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, D4. I appreciate you. Appreciate the kind words. Um, did you grow up in the black neighborhoods? Not see now, now. You guys are asking the pertinent questions, so I'll tell you guys exactly where I grew up. So, I grew up in a place called Dania Beach, which is like Dania Beach is it's nestled, it's sandwiched right in between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. So, it's like I'm gonna say it's 45 minutes. 40 to 45 minutes north of Miami, and it's 15, it's 10 to 15 minutes south of Fort Lauderdale. So I, I, I could get to Miami and Fort Lauderdale pretty easily. I grew up in West Dania, which is like West Dania is kind of in the middle of everything. So like I was right near the train track. So the ghetto was right across the train tracks. And then East Dania, which is across the street, would be going towards the beach. So you'd have a lot of the you know nicer neighborhoods. So I kind of got a bit of everything. And then I went to I went to the I went to I went to this school called South Broad High School. And that school was like going to that school, I feel like really prepared me to deal with all walks of life because at South Broad High School, you're literally sandwiched in between all ethnic groups. You know, we had hella black kids, Haitian kids, Jamaican kids, um, of course, plenty of Latinos and Latinas, you know, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Cubans, Colombians, every Latin American country under the sun. Went to school with me, and then the caveat to all this is, and people and people that don't don't know this about Miami and South Florida, but a lot of Europeans, the French, the Romanians, I mean, all kinds of French people, the Italians. So I got a a, a real deep, uh, I got a very multicultural experience, more so than most people, and I feel like it prepared me to to be in boxing, and it prepared me to deal with all walks of life. So, um. I didn't grow up like directly, directly in the black neighborhoods, but I had plenty of friends in the black neighborhoods. The the ghetto in Dania Beach was this was this was this neighborhood called Liberia, and Kodak Black Kodak Black used to chill in Liberia all the time, and I used to, I used to go to Liberia all the time to go visit my friends over there back in the day. They used to have like the corner stores and stuff um, near this one school called Addicts Middle School, and I used to have I used to go there all the time. So you know, I had I had an interesting upbringing, you know. LMAO, Blair Cobbs is a, is a disgrace to boxing. He embarrassed himself like Bona Deal Maidana. Yeah, man. Um, I'm not gonna say he's a disgrace. I like Blair Cobbs. A big Blair Cobbs fan. BT, do you do you have black ancestry? I know Puerto Rico. Yeah, I, I definitely do. I mean, I never I've never done an ancestry test, but I definitely have black ancestry because a lot of my um like my grandfather, RIP Grandpa George, he was he was dark. I mean, he was dark, dark. My mom is kind of dark. Um, you know, I'm Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban. There's blacks. There's there's black ancestry in all those damn countries. So I never done a test, but I would think um, I would think I do. Maybe maybe I gotta do. Maybe 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 that could be alive one day. True School Sports does does the ancestry test. We get the final verdict from ancestry.com. B Brown wants to know what day is what day is this? Today is day number sixty of the fight series and um, of the 90 days of boxing. And today is also, what is it, Tuesday? How big is the Mexican and Asian community in Florida or where you grew up at? It's not that big. Um, where I grew up specifically, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there was barely any Asians to speak of. South Florida in general doesn't have a lot of Asians. But where I live now, I live in the Mexican capital of South Florida, which is Homestead. So, um where I live now, there's a lot of Mexicans, but where I grew up, there weren't a lot of Mexicans. Um, yeah. South Broward High School is a performance art school. Your your school was indoor and had lockers in a giant field. My school did not have lockers, Hyro. You're wrong about that. And um, South South Broward is nice now. It wasn't nice when I went there. They got a pool and everything. Yeah, you could say that. You could definitely say that. What are your favorite European girls, BT? Oh, the, the Romani Romanians, hands hands down. 
You know, European women in general are very beautiful women. You know, they got uh, Russian women are nice, Croatian women are nice, the Finnish women. Uh, well, there's beauty in every every culture, really. But from my experience, man, the Romanian women, especially here in South Florida, are the best. Pops was wild on Saturday. He said the N word. Yeah, he was going crazy. <laughs> he was going, he was, he was going, he was having a, that was the Heineken speaking, but, uh, you know, Pops is always fired up. We always got Pops fired up here on True School Sports. Are you going to catch our bell on Trilla TV? Is, is that this weekend? Shit, they, 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 there's not much else going on in boxing, so I might, I might have to check out our bell. I'm scared of Florida because of the hurricanes. Uh, we don't really get a lot of hurricanes. Everybody says that. People always say that the hurricanes. Uh, the last like big hurricane we had was like 2006 or seven, which is Hurricane Wilma. That was a Category 3. Russian women are as cold as Siberian winter. Uh, I mean, it depends, man. I don't want to generalize nobody. I, I don't think that's fair to all Russian women, women but a lot of them – a lot of them, um, it can be cold. It all, it all depends. BT, you have no choice to watch UFC since there's no boxing on Saturday. Who the hell is fighting on UFC? Because I'm going to tell you all like this. We might go live for hockey. <laughs> if, if, if I get to a point, if, there, if there's nothing to talk about in boxing, we, we might go live for hockey, for the Panthers. Which Asian country do you want to visit the most? Uh, I've already visited the Asian country I wanted to visit the most, which is Japan. And I'll be going back to Japan uh, in the next four or five months. But apart from Japan, uh, definitely South Korea. I've heard great things about South Korea. South Korea looks like a fun country to explore. And why not? Who's who, but who who's fighting on UFC? Like, who's the main event? Is, is it anybody mainstream? Because... I don't know shit about MMA, so it has to be somebody super duper mainstream. The Panthers are playing the Rangers on Saturday, are they? Because I know, I know the Panthers got we got we got the Nashville Predators on Thursday here at home, and they are playing the Rangers, and and that's a big game. That that that's two of the top teams in the East. That could be the potential Eastern Conference Finals preview. So shit, you know what? We, we might we might go live for hockey on Saturday. We might switch things up. Cause the Payton and Donald Smith, I mean, it's a, it's a good little fight, but it's gonna be one of those boring British afternoon cards, you know, where they don't really have like great undercar fights like that. So I don't know if it's worth putting myself the torture. Just just go ahead and um just go ahead and just watch hockey, you know. <laughs> um do you think the Panthers are winning the division? Should I add them to the parlay we're building, bro? Ah, oh, it's tough, man. It's tough. I mean, they're, they're literally like – they're one point above the Boston Bruins. Boston Bruins are a great team. The Panthers may not even want to – I don't know. I'm going to say, yeah. I'm going to say they win the division because the sec, the first – was it? The first wild card spot is the Tampa Bay Lightning. And that's a much tougher matchup than playing, I think, right now it's the Red Wings or it could be the Capitals. So I think I think they're gonna want to avoid playing the Lightning in round one. So they're gonna they're gonna try to win the division. And um they're playing the Bruins March 26th. I might I might be at that game. And so uh, you know, that that game is gonna have a very big impact on who's winning the division because it's so close and Boston barely loses, the Panthers don't really lose like that. Two of the top teams in hockey, so uh, I'm gonna say yeah, they they, they probably want they, they definitely want to wind up winning the division, but I don't know, man. You never know. Hyrule says we want the Panthers. We'll we'll do a vote. You know, we'll, we'll do a vote. What would you guys rather me go live for Jose Zapata versus Dalton Smith, or should I go live for the Florida Panthers and New York Rangers on Saturday? We'll, we'll, we'll check we'll check the temperature because. I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. I will probably be more excited for the Panthers Rangers than like 80% of the live fight reactions I've done, honestly, just because it's a big game. Um, Dalton Smith, I mean, Dalton Smith is like, eh, Jose Zapata is kind of old. 
you know, I mean, let, let's check the undercard. Let's see who who on the, are there any undercard fights that are worth talking about on Dalton Dalton Smith versus Jose Zapata. Let, let's see, because because if not, you know, we might we might we might have to watch Matthew Kachuk. We might have to watch Barkov in the in the greatest show on ice since Disney on ice, the Panthers. We're gonna convert. We're gonna convert everybody on True School Sports into Florida Panthers fans. Oh my God! So you you got Campbell Hatton fighting for the the Central Area title. Oh my God! Terry Harvard versus Sandy Ryan. So you got women's boxing on the card, and then the co-main event is Ishmael Davis versus Troy Williamson. That's probably the best fight on, on the undercard, and that's the co-main event. So with the way I'm seeing it, we might just get the Panthers. We might just get hockey. The Canucks versus the Bruins is who I have for the chip. I mean, that's not a bad prediction, but I don't. Um, I obviously I don't agree with that. You know, that team is winning the Stanley Cup. The Panthers are winning. The, the Cup is coming home this year. Nothing is getting in the way of it. Not the Bruins. Not the Rangers. The only two teams. The only two teams that could beat the Panthers to have a chance at all are the Lightning and the Knights. Everyone else. Is uh is getting smashed. Is Pops gonna go? Yes. Oh my god. Yes. There's actually a short um Hyro. I don't know if you saw it. There's a short of Pops at the Panthers game that I posted about a week ago. Go check it out. Pops, Pops might get more hype for hockey than we do boxing because because we, we we love our Panthers, you know. We, Pops and I have been going to Panthers game since I was seven, and not, now I'm 29. So that's 22 years of us going to Panthers games. They were they were trash for, for most of my childhood, and this is the best they've ever been the last you know three four years. So we've been really enjoying it, and and it's been a beautiful time in our lives. And and yeah, BT, um, bro, I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the Panthers with the boxing part. Okay, hopefully they'll, they'll let you down. Bam, BT goes to Google right away to research it. BT, watch the UFC main fight this week. The chick in the main event looks like Nisa. Okay, let me see that. Let me see. Let me see. What, 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 what are we working with here? UFC fight schedule. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna see who who is this woman. Um, Amanda Rebos. Is that is that her? You see this Amanda Rebos chick? Is that her? Amanda. Reba, let's see, let's see what what we got what we got here. Is that who you're referring to? Are you referring to Amanda Rebos? Because none none of these girls look like Sinisa. Yeah, none, none of these girls look like Sinisa. But um, I'll tell you this: the uh, you 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 could probably tell me who's that girl. There was a girl that that's a UFC fighter. That's going out with Callum Walsh, a little Brazilian girl. She's she's cute. She's nice. Well, who who is she? You got you guys know? Forgot her name. But I, when I when I was researching um when I was researching Callum Walsh, I found out he want, he goes out with some MMA chick. Tabitha Richie. Yeah, that, that was her. That was her name. How does it feel? The next generation of players chose Florida. This time around than before. You're talking about uh talking about the Panthers? It, it feels good that players want to come play for the Panthers, man. I remember remember when these guys, the Panthers were like a retirement home for hockey. So the fact that you got like top players like Matthew Kuchuk and Vladimir Tarasenko and all these great players, they voluntarily chose to come to the Panthers. It just it's so different than when I was a kid. And I'm I'm enjoying every second of it. And man, it would just it would mean the world to me. Like, if the Panthers, I'm telling you right now, if, if and God willing, if the Panthers win the Stanley Cup, it's going to be, like, one of the top five greatest days of my life. Like, it's going to be up there with, like, giving my life to Jesus, um, covering boxing, um, having my first kid, whenever that is. You know, regardless of what happens in my life, it'll be in the top five days of my life, hands down. That's how much it means. Detroit, what's good? Ali 313, what's good, champ? He says, what up? What's good, man? Just just talking. You know, we, we, I've been just rambling about 
was talking boxing for a lot earlier. I was talking about, you know, Benavidez and Canelo. Then I talked about Angelo Leo's upcoming fight. Then I talked about Navarrete's fight getting announced. Now I'm just talking about whatever. I'm debating about whether I should go live for Zapata and Dalton Smith or go live for the hockey game. You know, because Dalton Smith versus Zapata is a, eh, it's a F fight. It's whatever. BT, is, is AJ the most technical heavyweight as far for now? What are your thoughts? Is he the most technical heavyweight in the world? He's, he's very technical. I don't know if he's the most technical. I mean, you got Usyk. You got um, Hergovich. I mean, there's, there's some pretty technical heavyweights. So I, I don't know. He says, I haven't... um. I haven't gloated about that four win yet. America won. Yeah, Raymond Ford, man. I was there. It was, it was a great fight. I was, um, I was, it was a pleasure to be there. I mean, obviously, it didn't go the way I thought it was going to go, but uh, order back Komatov and Ford put on a classic, one of the best fights I've ever been to and probably will ever go to. Who is Angelo Leo fighting? Uh, he's fighting Eduardo Baez. They just announced it today on um, on on social media. It's on Box Rec now. He's fighting Eduardo Baez, tough Mexican fighter. So his third fight in five months. He's ranked number seven in the WWBA, number thirteen in the IBF. So he's either gonna fight in an eliminator fight next, or he's gonna fight Venado Lopez for a world title. Those are the only two scenarios I can see for him if he if he wins this fight. Um. Where the fuck are you guys buying your ice? Like like jewelry? I don't know. <laughs> Bro, are you going to Japan for a Japanese fight card or are you just going there for fun? It's a little bit of both. I mean, obviously I'm going there to go to the gyms. I, I have connections in Japan now. I made I made quite a few connections when I was there. So I'll be going to a couple gyms and going to some new gyms as well and getting content and interviewing fighters. And um, I'm hoping that either Ken Shiro or Kosai Tanaka get a fight signed in Japan while I'm there because I could easily go to one of their fights because I know both of them and I know both their teams. So um, it all depends on what's going on while I'm there. But I would love to go to a fight in Japan. I'm definitely going to go to like at least four or five different gyms while I'm there. So a little bit, a little, little bit of both. I'll have my fun. Uh, I've already been there. Um, I've already been, I've been there. I've been, I went there last year. Um, nice gym kids. There are killers. Please make sure you, you share your contact in for collaboration. What do you mean by that? Uh, let me see. Yeah, it was. It was definitely a great fight. I wish you could have went. You were blessed, but happy for you getting it. Yeah, man. And like um, next a, a week, a week from today, and what's the Wednesday now? So a week from today, I'll be going to Arizona for uh, Valdez and Liam Wilson. I know you know Sinisa and Vias in that card as well. So I'll be going to that card on the 29th, but I leave the 27th. Then I'm going to Fondora versus or Zoo versus Fondora on the 30th. Then I'm going up a uh, I'm going up a Checo and, and Hitchens' this card on the April 6th. And then I'm flying back to Florida for Angels called April 10th. So it's going to be like, what, four fights in like 10 or 11 days? So going to be crazy. Um, Is there hype in Florida? Yeah, man. I, I would definitely say like, you know, South Florida, does. it's never had the reputation of being a hockey town. But I think the game is just growing so much. Uh, it's grown so much over the last three years. And uh, I think the Panthers going to the Cup and being – being really good and fun to watch and uh, the owners treating the fans really well these last four or five years um, has definitely grown the game a lot. The all-star game being here as well. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of excitement and I, and, I, and it's going to be great, you know, but guys, look, it, I gave you guys two hours. It's 1 30 AM here in the morning. I, I'm very appreciative of everybody who joined the live and contributed and super chatted and hit the like button and all that stuff. But um, I'm going to get up on out of here. Uh, make sure you guys check out all the content here on True School Sports. Make sure you guys definitely, um, you know, definitely check out that Philip Hergovich interview if you haven't already. 
and stay tuned for any and all content here on True School Sports. And, you know, like I say in every single one of these videos, you can love me or you can hate me, but I'm just kidding from Daniel. So until next time, take your eyes.